The Tale of Benjamin Bunny for the Children of Sorry from Old Mr. Bunny by Beatrix Potter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. One morning, a little rabbit sat on a bank. He pricked his ears and listened to the trip-trot, trip-trot of a pony. A gig was coming along the road. It was driven by Mr. MacGregor, and beside him sat Mrs. MacGregor in her best bonnet. As soon as they had passed, little Benjamin Bunny slid down into the road and set off with a hop, skip, and a jump to call upon his relations, who lived in the wood at the back of Mr. MacGregor's garden. That wood was full of rabbit holes, and in the neatest, sandiest hole of all, cousins Flopsy, Mopsy, Cottontail, and Peter. Old Mrs. Rabbit was a widow. She earned her living by knitting rabbit wool mittens and muffetees. I once bought a pair at a bazaar. She also sold herbs and rosemary tea and rabbit tobacco, which is what we call lavender. Little Benjamin did not very much want to see his aunt. He came round the back of the fir tree and nearly tumbled upon the top of his cousin Peter. Peter was sitting by himself. He looked poorly and was dressed in a red cotton pocket handkerchief. Peter! said little Benjamin in a whisper. Who has got your clothes? Peter replied, The scarecrow in Mr. MacGregor's garden, and described how he had been chased about the garden and had dropped his shoes and coat. Little Benjamin sat down beside his cousin and assured him that Mr. MacGregor had gone out in a gig, and Mrs. MacGregor also, and certainly for the day, because she was wearing her best bonnet. Peter said he hoped that it would rain. At this point, old Mrs. Rabbit's voice was heard inside the rabbit hole, calling, Cottontail, Cottontail, fetch some more chamomile. Peter said he thought he might feel better if he went for a walk. They went away hand in hand and got upon the flat top of the wall at the bottom of the wood. From here they looked down into Mr. MacGregor's garden. Peter's coat and shoes were plainly to be seen upon the scarecrow, topped with an old tam shanter of Mr. MacGregor's. Little Benjamin said, It spoils people's clothes to squeeze under a gate. The proper way to get in is to climb down a pear tree. Peter fell down head first, but it was of no consequence, as the bed below was newly raked and quite soft. It had been sown with lettuces. They left a great many odd little footmarks all over the bed, especially little Benjamin, who was wearing clogs. Little Benjamin said that the first thing to be done was to get back Peter's clothes, in order that they might be able to use the pocket handkerchief. They took them off the scarecrow. There had been rain during the night, there was water in the shoes, and the coat was somewhat shrunk. Benjamin tried on the tam shanter but it was too big for him. Then he suggested that they should fill the pocket handkerchief with onions, as a little present for his aunt. Peter did not seem to be enjoying himself. He kept hearing noises. Benjamin, on the contrary, was perfectly at home and ate a lettuce leaf. He said that he was in the habit of coming to the garden with his father to get lettuces for their Sunday dinner. The name of little Benjamin's papa was old Mr. Benjamin Bunny. The lettuces certainly were very fine. Peter did not eat anything. He said he should like to go home. Presently he dropped half the onions. Little Benjamin said that it was not possible to get back up the pear tree with a load of vegetables. He led the way boldly towards the other end of the garden. They went along a little walk on planks under a sunny red brick wall. The mice sat on their doorsteps cracking cherry stones. They winked at Peter Rabbit and little Benjamin Bunny. Presently 
Peter let the pocket handkerchief go again. They got amongst the flower pots and frames and tubs. Peter heard noises worse than ever. His eyes were as big as lollipops. He was a step or two in front of his cousin when he suddenly stopped. This is what those little rabbits saw round that corner. Little Benjamin took one look and then, in half a minute less than no time, he hid himself and Peter and the onions underneath a large basket. The cat got up and stretched herself and came and sniffed at the basket. Perhaps she liked the smell of onions. Anyway, she sat down upon the top of the basket. She sat there for five hours. I cannot draw you a picture of Peter and Benjamin underneath the basket, because it was quite dark, and because the smell of onions was fearful. It made Peter Rabbit and little Benjamin cry. The sun got round behind the wood, and it was quite late in the afternoon, but still the cat sat upon the basket. At length there was a pitter-patter, pitter-patter, and some bits of mortar fell from the wall above. The cat looked up and saw old Mr. Benjamin Bunny prancing along the top of the wall of the upper terrace. He was smoking a pipe of rabbit tobacco and had a little switch in his hand. He was looking for his son. Old Mr. Bunny had no opinion whatever of cats. He took a tremendous jump off the top of the wall onto the top of the cat and cuffed it off the basket and kicked it into the garden house, scratching off a handful of fur. The cat was too much surprised to scratch back. When old Mr. Bunny had driven the cat into the greenhouse, he locked the door. Then he came back to the basket and took out his son Benjamin by the ears and whipped him with the little switch. Then he took out his nephew Peter. Then he took out the handkerchief of onions and marched out of the garden. When Mr. MacGregor returned about half an hour later, he observed several things which perplexed him. It looked as though some person had been walking all over the garden in a pair of clogs, only the footmarks were too ridiculously little. Also, he could not understand how the cat could have managed to shut herself up inside the greenhouse, locking the door upon the outside. When Peter got home, his mother forgave him because she was so glad to see that he had found his shoes and coat. Cottontail and Peter folded up the pocket handkerchief and old Mrs. Rabbit strung up the onions and hung them from the kitchen ceiling with the rabbit tobacco. End of The Tale of Benjamin Bunny Recording by Peter Tomlinson The Bremen Town Musicians There was once an ass whose master had made him carry sacks to the mill for many a long year, but whose strength began at last to fail, so that each day as it came found him less capable of work. Then his master began to think of turning him out, but the ass, guessing that something was in the wind that boded him no good, ran away, taking the road to Bremen, for there he thought he might get an engagement as a town musician. When he had gone a little way, he found a hound lying by the side of the road, panting, as if he had run a long way. "'Now, hold fast. What are you so out of breath about?' said the ass. "'Oh, dear,' said the dog, "'now I am old. I get weaker every day and can do no good in the hunt. So, as my master was going to have me killed, I have made my escape. But now how am I to gain a living?' "'I will tell you what,' said the ass. I am going to Bremen to become town musician. You may as well go with me and take up music, too. I can play the lute, and you can beat the drum. And the dog consented, and they walked on together. It was not long before they came to a cat sitting in the road, looking as dismal as three wet days. Now, then, what is the matter with you, old shaver? said the ass. I should like to know who would be cheerful when his neck is in danger, answered the cat. Now that I am old, my teeth are getting blunt, and I would rather sit by the oven and purr than run about after mice, and my mistress wanted to drown me, so I took myself off. But good advice is scarce, and I do not know what is to become of me. 
"'Go with us to Bremen,' said the ass, "'and become town musician. "'You understand serenading.' "'The cat thought well of the idea "'and went with them accordingly. "'After that the three travellers passed by a yard, "'and a cock was perched on the gate, "'crowing with all his might. "'Your cries are enough to pierce bone and marrow,' "'said the ass. "'What is the matter?' I have foretold good weather for Lady Day, so that all the shirts may be washed and dried, and now on Sunday morning company is coming, and the mistress has told the cook that I must be made into soup, and this evening my neck is to be wrung so that I am crowing with all my might while I can. You had much better go with us, Chanticleer, said the ass. We are going to Bremen. At any rate, that will be better than dying." You have a powerful voice, and when we are all performing together, it will have a very good effect. So the cock consented, and they went on, all four together. But Bremen was too far off to be reached in one day, and towards evening they came to a wood where they determined to pass the night. The ass and the dog lay down under a large tree. The cat got up among the branches, and the cock flew up to the top, as that was the safest place for him. Before he went to sleep he looked all round him to the four points of the compass, and perceived in the distance a little light shining, and he called out to his companions that there must be a house not far off, as he could see a light. So the ass said, We had better get up and go there, for these are uncomfortable quarters. The dog began to fancy a few bones, not quite bare, would do him good. And they all set off in the direction of the light and it grew larger and brighter, until at last it led them to a robber's house, all lighted up. The ass, being the biggest, went up to the window and looked in. "'Well, what do you see?' asked the dog. "'What do I see?' answered the ass. "'Here is a table set out with splendid eatables and drinkables, and robbers sitting at it, and making themselves very comfortable.' "'That would just suit us,' said the cock. "'Yes, indeed, I wish we were there,' said the ass." Then they consulted together how it should be managed, so as to get the robbers out of the house, and at last they hit on a plan. The ass was to place his forefeet on the window sill, the dog was to get on the ass's back, the cat on the top of the dog, and lastly the cock was to fly up and perch on the cat's head. When that was done, at a given signal they all began to perform their music. The ass brayed, the dog barked, the cat mewed and the cock crowed. Then they burst through into the room, breaking all the panes of glass. The robbers fled at the dreadful sound. They thought it was some goblin, and fled to the wood in the utmost terror. Then the four companions sat down to eat, made free with the remains of the meal, and feasted as if they had been hungry for a month. And when they had finished they put out the lights, and each sought out a sleeping place, to suit his nature and habits. The ass laid himself down outside on the dunghill, the dog behind the door, the cat on the hearth by the warm ashes, and the cock settled himself in the cock-loft. And as they were all tired with their long journey, they soon fell fast asleep. When midnight drew near, and the robbers from afar saw that no light was burning, and that everything appeared quiet, their captain said to them that he thought that they had run away without reason telling one of them to go and reconnoitre. So one of them went and found everything quite quiet. He went into the kitchen to strike a light, and taking the glowing fiery eyes of the cat for burning coals, he held a match to them in order to kindle it. But the cat, not seeing the joke, flew into his face, spitting and scratching. Then he cried out in terror and ran to get out at the back door. But the dog, who was lying there, ran at him, and bit his leg, and as he was rushing through the yard by the dunghill, the ass struck out and gave him a great kick with his hind foot, and the cock, who had been wakened with the noise, and felt quite brisk, cried out, Cock-a-doodle-doo! Then the robber got back as well as he could to his captain, and said, Oh, dear, in that house there is a gruesome witch, and I felt her breath and her long nails in my face and by the door there stands a man who stabbed me in the leg with a knife, and in the yard there lies a black spectre who beat me with his wooden club, and above upon the roof there sits the justice, who cried, Bring that rogue here! And so I ran away from the place as fast as I could. 
From that time forward the robbers never ventured to that house, and the four Bremen town musicians found themselves so well off where they were that there they stayed. And the person who last related this tale is still living, as you see. End of the Bremen Town Musicians by the Brothers Grimm Read by Nan Dodge The Demon of the Mountain by Catherine Pyle This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Demon of the Mountain a Transylvanian Gypsy Tale There once was a poor peasant lad who was sober and honest and industrious, and yet he never could succeed in the world. He was barely able to make enough to keep body and soul together. One night he had a dream, and in his dream a venerable-looking old man with a long gray beard and wearing a golden crown upon his head appeared to him. "'My son,' said the old man, "'go to the top of the mountain that lies beyond the rocky plain to the eastward. "'There fortune awaits thee. "'Only be brave and daring. "'Go, and delay not.' "'In the morning, when the youth awoke, "'he remembered his dream and wondered over it for a time, "'but it was soon forgotten. "'The next night the old man appeared to him again while he was sleeping, and regarded him with a severe expression. "'Why hast thou not already set out for the mountain?' he asked. "'Fortune will not await thee forever.' When the youth awoke, he wondered that he should have dreamed of the same old man a second time. But still he regarded the dream as meaning nothing, and before the end of the day he had forgotten it. But the third night the same old man appeared to him for still a third time. "'How is this?' he cried. "'By this time thou shouldst have been well on thy way to the mountain. Up, up, delay not, or disaster will follow.' When the youth awoke, he determined to set out at once for the mountain. He packed up enough food for the journey and started out without further delay. All day he traveled across the rocky plain, and by nighttime he had arrived at the foot of the mountain. Here he rested, and the next day he set out to climb to the top. Up and up he went, and so at last came to the mouth of a cave that was at the summit. A light shone out from the cave, and when the lad looked into it he saw a beautiful maiden sitting there, fair beyond all words. Her hair was of pure gold and shone like sunlight, and it was so long it fell down all about her and trailed on the floor, and out of her hair she was weaving a mantle. When the beauty saw the lad, she cried out for wonder. "'Who art thou, rash youth?' she called to him. "'Who hath dared to venture into the cave of the mountain demon?' "'I am a poor peasant who lives down below here on the other side of the plain,' he answered, "'and I did not know this was a demon's cave. "'But how comest thou hither?' "'An old man told me to come. "'He appeared to me three times in a dream with a crown of gold on his head, "'and he told me to journey to the top of the mountain, "'and I would find fortune awaiting me. "'He spoke the truth.' answered the maiden. That poor old man was my father. He was a king, and I am a princess. He who rescues me may have me for a bride, if he will, and my kingdom for a dowry. The princess then told the lad that years before the demon of this mountain had seen her beside a spring where she was bathing with her maidens. He had fallen in love with her, and for her sake he had made war on her father and slain him. But her he had brought here to his cave, and had set her to weaving a mantle out of her hair. When the mantle was finished, she would be obliged to marry him, and already it was almost done. But how may you be rescued? asked the lad. That is a difficult and dangerous task, replied the beauty, but it may be done 
if you have the courage to stay here for three nights, said the princess, and for those three nights will allow the demon to torment you as he will, and yet are brave enough to utter never a sound, then his power over me will be broken, and I will be free from him. When the youth heard that the only way he could save the princess was by allowing the demon to torment him for three nights, his ardor was somewhat cooled. And if I were to rescue you, would you be willing to take me for a husband? he asked. Yes, I would, answered the princess. If you can endure those torments for my sake, then I will know you love me truly, and that you are indeed a brave soul and a daring one. The youth thought for a while. Very well, he said. At least I will try it. Then he sat down, and he and the princess talked together, and she was so wise and gentle and witty in her talk that with every hour that passed he loved her better and better. Toward evening there was a great noise outside and a glare of red light, and the mountain demon rushed into the cave, and a terrible creature he was to look at, I can tell you. He was black as soot, and his eyes shone in his head like coals of fire. He had horns and a tail, and instead of nails, he had long claws on his fingers, and with every breath he sent out fire and cinders. When the lad saw the demon, he began to shake and tremble, and he wished he were well out of that adventure and home again, even if he had to miss having a princess for a wife. However, it was too late to wish that now. The demon wasted no words upon the lad, but he picked him up and threw him down on the floor, and then he danced about on him, up and down. After he'd finished dancing on him, he hauled him about and pulled his ears and his hair and did everything he could to make him cry out, and almost he succeeded. But still the youth remembered what the princess had said and managed to keep his lips closed. And when the first ray of daylight shone into the cave, the demon was obliged to depart, for so it is with the evil ones. Then the princess came and lifted the youth up and comforted him, and she took down a flask from the wall where it hung and rubbed him over with the ointment that was in it, and then his bruises disappeared, for he had been black and blue all over from the way the demon had danced on him. This is one night past, and you have stood it bravely, said the princess. Yes, uh, that is all very well, answered the youth, but I doubt whether I can stand two more nights of it. Perhaps it would have been better if I had kept away altogether, or at least that I go away now before I suffer any more torments that may be even worse. Do not say that, cried the princess, and she began to weep. When the lad saw her tears, his heart melted with pity for her, and he promised that he would not desert her whatever happened, but would do his best to rescue her. Then the princess was cheered and brought out all sorts of good things that the demon had stored away, and she and the lad ate and drank together and became quite merry. After a while it became dark, however, and the lad's heart sank down again. At the same hour as the night before, the demon came rushing back into the cave again, and when he saw the lad was still there, he howled aloud for very rage. Again he caught up the lad and dashed him down on the floor of the cave, and this time he took a hammer and pounded him with it until it seemed to the lad that every bone in his body was beaten to a jelly. He had to clench his teeth together to keep from crying out. All night the demon tormented him until he was more dead than alive. But when morning came, the evil one was obliged to give over as before, and he disappeared out of the cave, howling horribly. The princess came and rubbed the lad all over with the ointment as before, and then he became quite strong and well and sound again. But now the lad was all for starting out for home. He had had enough of the demon in his doings. The princess had to beg and implore and entreat him before he would consent to remain for still the third night. "'What good will it do me, or you either?' he said, "'if the demon makes an end of me, 
and that I fear he will do if he finds me here a third time. Oh, my dear lad, surely you love me enough to suffer still one other little time, wept the princess. I do not believe the demon has really the power to kill you, and think, if you allow him to torment you only one more night and still keep silence, then you will have me for a wife and a kingdom to reign over, and we will live together happily forever. Very well, said the lad at last. I will try and stand it this one third time, though I misdoubt me, I am a fool for my pains. So when the demon came home that night, there was the lad still sitting in the cave with the princess. The demon was so enraged, he swelled up to twice his size and turned blacker than ever. He caught the lad from off the stool where he was sitting and threw him on the floor, and then he picked up a pair of pincers and pinched him all over. All night the demon kept at him. He rolled him about over the floor and knocked him against the stools and tables, and it seemed sometimes as though the lad would be obliged to cry for mercy. But he bit his lips till they bled, and not a sound came from between them. At last it was morning, and when the sun shone into the cave, the demon gave a howl and burst with a noise like a thunderclap and there was nothing left of him but a little heap of black dust on the floor. But the lad lay there without sound or motion, as though he were dead. Then for the third time the princess rubbed him with the ointment, and he opened his eyes and rose up and was quite well again. The princess bade him go to the back of the cave where there was a spring of water and bathe himself in it. This he did, and as soon as he had bathed, he became the handsomest young man that ever was seen, and instead of poor and ragged clothes, he was dressed in silks and velvets, and he had a jeweled ring upon his finger and a golden crown on his head. "'And now,' said the princess, "'we will return to my own country, "'and you shall be king, and I will be queen, "'and we will live happily together from this time on.' "'As she said, so it was, "'and she and the peasant lad returned to her kingdom "'and were married, and they loved each other so dearly "'that there never was a crossword between them. I went to the wedding along with all the others that were bidden, and ate and drank so much that I could hardly walk home again. End of A Demon of the Mountain by Catherine Pyle Read by Wayne Cook Fun and Nonsense by Willard Bonte This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Introduction Fun and Nonsense are a pair of merry little twins, and when they come to visit us, they bring their friends, the Grins. They're coming now to visit you. This page will call the door. To open wide, just turn the leaf. Why, we have met before. The Barber Said Chocolate Drop the Barber, Why, bless my ugly soul, I'll ask that stick of peppermint to be my barber pole. The Refusal Dear sweet Lady Cracker, My passions you know, And I scorn them, Judge Wafer, As you're lacking in dough. A Hopeless Case What is the use? Quoth the Whitewash Brush. I'll comb my hair no more, for try as I will to make it lie, it still stays pompadour. The Greenhorn A lettuce walking out one day lost its head, so lost its way. A pumpkin happened on the scene, and said it came from being green. Old Mr. Match Old Mr. Match gave his head a good scratch, and his face lighted up with a smile. It is getting quite dark, but with my cheery spark, I will lighten the day for a while. 
Thoughts Unstrung Alas, I fear, my mind doth wander, and o'er this narrative I ponder. I usually know what I have read, but this time I have lost the thread. The Miser The pocketbook has money. On that subject he is daft. But when one strikes him for a loan, he answers, I am strapped. Dr. Key's answer. Shine? inquired the monkey wrench of stately Dr. Key. No, replied the haughty soul. No monkey shines for me. The Chase Mr. Brush on his steed, dashing with speed, was asked if he had time to spare. Said he with a smile, I'll be back in a while, but at present I'm hunting the hare. A rising doctor. Dr. Yeastcake, it's hard for me to speak, as I haven't risen for more than a week. Take this, Mr. Roll, and never you fear. You'll rise before morning, so be of good cheer. The Sailor Bold Pilot Von Pretzel's a crusty old salt who wears a rich shade of tan, which he did not acquire at sea, by the way, but in a warm baking pan. Overheard in the cornfield, said young Mr. Pumpkin to old Mr. Squash, do you think Mr. Corn overhears what we say when we talk of his self-conscious stock and is moving Miss Mellon to tears? I cannot decide. Mr. Squash then replied, but I've had my suspicion for years. Because he's so tall, he can lean over all. Then look at the size of his ears. Twins There go the scissor twins, cutting as ever. Some think them sharp, but few think them clever. A sharp lover I dread you much, my little miss. You're such a dainty thing. I fear, although quite sharp myself, you've got me on the string. The Greedy Little Pitchers Now, my pretty little dears, little pitchers have big ears. But never let me hear it said that your mouse are big instead. Obliging Mr. Hammer Old Mr. Hammer was so very, very good that he gave Mr. Shingle Nail a drive through the wood. The Malicious Brush When poor little hand glass was loudly berated for casting reflections, the brush was elated. The Wise Pen There was a pen in our town, and he was wondrous size, for he knew just when to cross his T's and when to dot his I's. But one small thing he did not know, a simple thing at that, he did not know twas nice to wipe his feet off on the mat. End of Fun and Nonsense by Willard Bonte. This recording is in the public domain. The Giant Maiden, retold by Marie H. Frary and Charles M. Stebbins. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Many years ago, there lived a mighty race of giants. They were as tall as the hills, and dwelt in great castles as large as mountains. To them, the world was a very small place indeed. These giants loved the world, however, and all the many beautiful things in it. The sunshine, the song of birds, the green fields, the woods, the rivers, and the blue sky were all charming to them. So it was that they used to walk a great deal. They used to go everywhere and see everything that was good to see. When they walked, however, they stepped from hilltop to hilltop. They never went down into the valleys. The king of the giants was a great and good man. He was kind to his people and kind to his children, 
and they all loved and honored him one of his children was a beautiful girl she would soon be a woman but she still loved playthings like the rest of the giants hilda the king's daughter liked to go walking out into the world she often found most interesting playthings sometimes she would bring home a bear or a baby elephant one day hilda went out for a walk she had had to stay in the castle for several days because of the rain this was a beautiful day however and she walked a long way even for a giant's daughter the maiden stepped over valley after valley from hilltop to hilltop till she was far away from home she had never gone so far before the country seemed quite different and it was pleasant too at last she stopped and looked about her to enjoy the scene before her was a wide valley and in it she saw many curious things one of them was a man ploughing with his horses she had never seen anything like that before oh she cried what cute playthings they will make they will be real live playthings too how nice the little creature is that walks behind and the thing he is holding that will make a fine toy and the other animals will be such lovely pets i must have them all hilda reached down into the valley and picked up the man the plough and the horses and tucked them away in her apron then she went home to tell her father see what lovely playthings i have found she called to him as she ran into the great castle my darling child said the good king these are not playthings you must take them back and leave them where you found them you must never touch them again this is a man and he has a wife and children at home they will be very sad if he does not come back to them by and by he went on the whole world will be owned by little creatures like this man and we shall be no more the king's daughter was very sad when she heard these things she did not want to give up such delightful playthings but she had a kind heart and she loved her father she knew too that he understood things much better than she did so she put the man the plough and the horses into her apron again and took them back to the place where she had found them the man was very happy when she set him down in the field again his good wife and his children were there too and they rejoiced to see him again they feared something had happened to him the maiden looked on for a time wondering about it all it made her glad to see how happy the man and his wife and children were she was no longer sorry that she had given up her playthings and she went home with a light heart end of the giant maiden retold by marie h frary and charles m stebbins read by nemo the enchanted waterfall by catherine pyle this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Enchanted Waterfall, a Japanese story. There was once a good and dutiful youth named Urashima, who worked hard and long every day to support his parents who were old and quite helpless. But, work as he might, he was only able to supply them with the poorest sort of food and clothing. His mother was quite content with this and was always cheerful, but his father did nothing but complain from morning till night and was always reproaching his son because he could not do better for him. I do not know how it is, he would say. When I was young, I was able to supply my parents with everything they wished, and here my son gives me nothing but the poorest sort of food, and not even a cup of sake. Footnote. A Japanese drink, of which they are very fond. End of footnote. If I could only have a cup of good sake now and then, I would be content. I think it is very hard that we have to live so miserably. I would never have allowed my father to go without his cup of sake, however poor I was. 
When the father talked in this way, Urashima felt very sad. He would go out and work harder than ever, but for all his work he could earn but a small sum each day. One time, the son went into the forest to cut wood. He went to a place where he had often gone before. He gathered together a great load of wood, as much as he could possibly carry, and bound it around with a cord. The day was hot and the sweat ran down his forehead. He was thirsty, too, but he knew there was no spring or stream anywhere near. He stopped to rest and wiped the sweat from his forehead before starting homeward with his load. He wiped away the sweat with his sleeve. Suddenly, as he stood there, he heard the sound of a waterfall close by. Urashima was very much surprised. Often as he had been there, he had never heard or seen any water anywhere near. He went a little farther into the wood and came to a high heap of rocks. They had always been dry before, but now a stream of shining water poured down over them. It seemed like magic. However, magic or not, the water looked cool and clear. So he took a cup he had brought with him, and filled it and lifted it to his lips to drink. What was his amazement to find that the cup was filled, not with water at all, but with the most delicious sake. Urashima could hardly believe it, but it was so. Filling the cup to the brim, he hastened home with it to his father. When he entered the house, his father looked at him with a frown, and immediately began to complain. Why have you left your work so early? Where is the wood you were to have brought home? How can you expect to succeed in the world if you only work an hour or so, and then come home to rest? My father, taste this sake, cried Urashima, and tell me whether it is not good. Sake? cried the old man. What do you mean? Where have you been able to get any sake? He took the cup from his son's hands and set it to his lips. He tasted and looked surprised. He tasted again, smacking his lips. Then his face beamed with delight. My dear son, cried he, where did you get this? Never before in my life have I tasted such delicious sake. I do not believe even the emperor himself has better. Urashima told his father the whole story. The old man found it hard to believe. You've always been a truthful lad, said he, and yet I can hardly think that this thing is possible. If, however, it is really so, it is nothing less than a miracle. It is indeed the truth I have told you, answered his son, though I myself find it hard to believe. The old man continued to sip the sake. While there was still quite a quantity left in the cup, a neighbor came in, and the old man invited him to taste it. The neighbor tasted and was delighted with it. Where did you get this? he asked. Was it a present from some great nobleman? I could not buy any such in the shops. The old man repeated to the neighbor the story that Urashima had told him. This is a strange story, said the man. He turned to Urashima and questioned him closely. The boy repeated the story, exactly as he had told it before, and as it had happened. The neighbor became very thoughtful, and soon after he went away. A little later, another neighbor came in and heard the story and tasted the sake, and then another and another. Before long, the story spread through the village, and anyone who could make any excuse came in to taste the sake and question Urashima. By evening, the sake was all gone, and the last of the people who came in could only smell the empty cup, and judge by that of how very good the sake must have been. The next morning, the old man aroused Urashima very early. My son, said he, take this pitcher, the largest we have in the house, and go out to the waterfall and fill it with sake. We will have a great many visitors today, and I would feel ashamed if we were not able to offer each one of them a drink. Urashima arose, dressed himself, and took the pitcher, and hastened away to the forest. It was so early that the village appeared to be sleeping as he went through it. But as he approached the waterfall, he saw that someone was there before him. It was the neighbor who had been the first to taste the sake. He had just arrived at the waterfall, and he had brought with him a pitcher even larger than the one Urashima carried. Before he could fill it, another neighbor came hastening through the forest, and then another, and another, and still more. They all carried pitchers and pots and buckets, and anything they had that would hold the most. Urashima hid behind the rocks to look and listen. The first neighbors who arrived looked rather ashamed as they saw each other. Well, said the one who had come first, I see we are here on the same errand. And why should we not have some of the sake as well as the old man? Urashima does not own the waterfall. That is true, said another. And true, true, cried the others. 
One of the last to come, a bustling and lively little man, hastened forward and would have filled his pitcher at once, but the others withheld him. It is not your turn, they cried. You came last, and yet you expect to drink first. But look, your pitcher is a great deal larger than mine, and so is his and his. And the little neighbor pointed to others of the villagers. If you fill all those large pitchers first, there may be nothing left for us who only expect to take a little. The men began to argue and dispute among themselves, but at last it was decided that the neighbor who had come first should fill his pitcher first, and then the others, according to the order in which they had come. The first comer now stepped briskly forward to the waterfall. He filled his pitcher, and lifting it, he took a deep drink from it. At once a look of surprise, and then of disappointment, and then of anger, appeared on his face. He spat out a mouthful on the ground. "'What is the matter?' asked the neighbors who were watching him. "'Is not the sake good?' "'Sake? This is not sake.' "'Not sake? What is it, then?' "'Water. What else should one expect to get from a waterfall?' "'But Urashima told us that Urashima is a rascal. "'If we had not all been simpletons, we would not have believed him. "'And yet he told his tale so seriously anyone might have been deceived. "'You mean it is only water? Yes. Not sake at all? No.' The other villagers now made haste to fill their pitchers at the waterfall, but when they drank, they found that not any one of them had anything but water in his pitcher, and not very good water at that. They were furious. He has deceived us, they cried. He has made a mock of us. No doubt he is comfortably in bed at this very moment and laughing at us for our pains. This thought made them so angry that they began to think how they could punish him. Let us go and get him, and give him a good beating. No, let us duck him. Yes, we will drag him here to the waterfall and duck him. He shall see that this is not so fine a joke as he thought. We will half drown him in his sake. Urashima, hearing them as he stood behind the rocks, was terrified. He was afraid to stay where he was, and walking very softly, he tried to make off through the forest. He would have done better to have stayed hidden, for suddenly one of the neighbors caught sight of him and raised a shout. There he goes, the sake drinker. Catch him! Duck him! Throw him into his own waterfall! The man ran after the boy and surrounded him and dragged him back to the waterfall. Indeed, indeed, I did not deceive you, cried Urashima. He was trembling all over and half weeping. It was here that I filled my cup, at this very waterfall, and it was sake and not water that I drew from it, as you yourselves can testify. Very well, said the first neighbor. If you did it once, you can do it again. Fill your pitcher from the waterfall. If sake flows into it, well and good. But if water, then you shall be punished as you deserve. Trembling, Urashima filled his pitcher as they bade him and handed it to the neighbor. The man lifted it up and drank from it. A look of wonder came over his face. The boy spoke the truth, he cried. It is indeed sake, and that of the best. One after another, the neighbors drank from the boy's pitcher and were convinced it was indeed full of sake. But only Urashima was able to obtain that drink from the waterfall. When the others tried again, their pitchers still only filled with water. Nor was Urashima himself able to fill their pitchers with sake for them. It was only in his own pitcher that the water became that most delicious drink. The neighbors now looked upon the good son with the greatest respect. They went home with him to his father and recounted to the old man all that had happened. They also told him that he had a very wonderful son and ought to prize him as he deserved. After that, Urashima lived on quietly in the village as before, though there was much talk about his wondrous power. He could draw a pitcher full of sake from the waterfall every day, but only once a day could he do this. If he filled the pitcher more than once, he obtained only water. In time, the rumors of his wonder-working power came to the ears of the emperor himself. One day a great train of magnificently dressed courtiers and noblemen appeared in the little village and stopped before the house where Urashima lived. In the midst of them rode no less a person than the emperor himself. He commanded the boy to show them the way to the waterfall and to draw a cup of sake for the emperor to taste. This the lad did, and when the emperor tasted the sake and found all he had heard was true, he was filled with wonder and admiration. He took Urashima home with him to his palace, and made him a great nobleman, and kept him always close to his own person. And from then on, Urashima lived beloved and honored by all, and his old father and mother never had a wish that he was not able to gratify. End of The Enchanted Waterfall by Catherine Pyle
Read by Colleen McMahon. Master Willie by Mrs. W. K. Clifford. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. There was once a little boy called Willie. I never knew his other name, and as he lived far off behind the mountain, we cannot go to inquire. He had fair hair and blue eyes, and there was something in his face that, when you had looked at him, made you feel quite happy and rested and think of all the things you meant to do by and by when you were wiser and stronger. He lived all alone with the tall aunt, who was very rich, in the big house at the end of the village. Every morning he went down the street with his little goat under his arm, and the village folk looked after him, and said, There goes Master Willie. The tall aunt had a very long neck. On the top of it was her head. On the top of her head she wore a white cap. Willie used often to look up at her and think that the cap was like snow upon the mountain. She was very fond of Willie, but she had lived a great many years and was always sitting still to think them over, and she had forgotten all the games she used to know, all the stories she had read when she was little, and when Willie asked her about them, would say, No, dear, no, I can't remember. Go to the woods and play. Sometimes she would take his face between her two hands and look at him well, while Willie felt quite sure that she was not thinking of him, but of someone else he did not know. And then she would kiss him and turn away quickly, saying, Go to the woods, dear. It is no good staying with an old woman. Then he, knowing that she wanted to be alone, would pick up his goat and hurry away. He had had a dear little sister called Apple Blossom, but a strange thing had happened to her. One day she overwound her very big doll that talked and walked, and the consequence was quite terrible. No sooner was the winding-up key out of the doll's side than it blinked its eyes, talked very fast, made faces, took Apple Blossom by the hand, saying, I am not your doll any longer, but you are my little girl, and led her right away. No one could tell whither, and no one was able to follow. The tall aunt and Willie only knew that she had gone to be the doll's little girl in some strange place where dolls were stronger and more important than human beings. After Apple Blossom left him, Willie had only his goat to play with. It was a poor little thing with no horns, no tail, and hardly any hair. But still, he loved it dearly, and put it under his arm every morning while he went along the street. "'It is only made of painted wood and a little hair, Master Willie,' said the blacksmith's wife one day. "'Why should you care for it? It is not even alive.' But if it were alive, anyone could love it. And living hands made it, the miller's wife said. I wonder what strange hands they were. Take care of it for the sake of them, little master. Yes, dame, I will, he answered gratefully. And he went on his way, thinking of the hands, wondering what tasks had been set them to do since they fashioned the little goat. He stayed all day in the woods, helping the children to gather nuts and blackberries. In the afternoon, he watched them go home with their aprons full. He looked after them longingly as they went on their way singing. If he had had a father and mother, or brothers and sisters, to whom he could have carried home nuts and blackberries, how merry he would have been. Sometimes he told the children how happy they were to live in a cottage with the door open all day, and the sweet breeze blowing in, and the cocks and hens strutting about outside and the pigs grunting in the styes at the end of the garden, to see the mother scrubbing and washing, to know that the father was working in the fields, and to run about and help and play, and be cuffed and kissed, just as it happened. Then they would answer, But you have the tall lady for your aunt, and the big house to live in, and the grand carriage to drive in, while we are poor and sometimes have little to eat and drink. Mother often tells us how fine it must be to be you. But the food that you eat is sweet because you are very hungry, he answered them. And no one sorrows in your house. As for the grand carriage, it is better to have a carriage if your heart is heavy. But when it is light, then you can run swiftly on your own two legs. Ah, poor Willie, 
how lonely he was. And yet the tall aunt loved him dearly. On hot, drowsy days he had many a good sleep, with his head resting against her high, thin shoulders, and her arms about him. One afternoon, clasping his goat as usual, he sat down by the pond. All the children had gone home, so he was quite alone. But he was glad to look at the pond and think. There were so many strange things in the world, it seemed as if he would never have done thinking about them. Not if he lived to be a hundred. He rested his elbows on his knees and sat staring at the pond. Overhead, the trees were whispering. Behind him, in and out of their holes, the rabbits whisked. Far off, he could hear the twitter of a swallow. The foxglove was dead. The bracken was turning brown. The cones from the fir trees were lying on the ground. As he watched, a strange thing happened. Slowly and slowly, the pond lengthened out and out, stretching away and away until it became a river. A long river that went on and on, right down the woods, past the great black firs, past the little cottage that was a ruin and only lived in now and then by a stray gypsy or a tired tramp, past the setting sun till it dipped into space beyond. Then many little boats came sailing towards Willie, and one stopped quite close to where he sat, just as if it were waiting for him. He looked at it well. It had a snow-white sail and a little man with a drawn sword for a figurehead. A voice that seemed to come from nowhere asked, Are you ready, Willie? Just as if he understood, he answered back, Not yet, not quite, dear queen, but I shall be soon. I should like to wait a little longer. No, no, come now, dear child, they are all waiting for you. So he got up and stepped into the boat, and it put out before he had even time to sit down. He looked at the rushes as the boat cut its way through them. He saw the hearts of the lilies as they lay spread open on their great, wide leaves. He went on and on beneath the crimson sky towards the setting sun, until he slipped into space with the river. He saw land at last, far on ahead, and as he drew near it, he understood whither the boat was bound. All along the shore there were hundreds and hundreds of dolls crowding down to the water's edge, looking as if they had expected him. They stared at him with their shining round eyes, but he just clasped his little goat tighter and closer, and sailed on nearer and nearer to the land. The dolls did not move, they stood still, smiling at him with their painted lips. Then, suddenly, they opened their painted mouths and put out their painted tongues at him, but still he was not afraid. He clasped the goat yet a little closer and called out, Apple Blossom, I am waiting. Are you here? Just as he had expected, he heard Apple Blossom's voice answering from the back of the toy town. Yes, dear brother, I am coming. So he drew close to the shore and waited for her. He saw her a long way off and waved his hand. I have come to fetch you, he said. But I cannot go with you unless I am bought, she answered sadly. For now there is a wire spring inside me, and look at my arms, dear brother and pulling up her pink muslin sleeves, she showed him that they were stuffed with sawdust. Go home and bring the money to pay for me, she cried, and then I can come home again. But the dolls had crowded up behind, so that he might not turn his boat round. Straight on, cried Apple Blossom in despair. What does it matter whether you go backwards or forwards, if you only keep straight when you live in a world that is round? So he sailed on once more beneath the sky that was getting gray, through all the shadows that gathered round, beneath the pale moon, and the little stars that came out one by one and watched him from the sky. I saw him coming towards the land of storybooks. That was how I knew about him, dear children. He was very tired and had fallen asleep, but the boat stopped quite naturally, as if it knew that I had been waiting for him. I stooped and kissed his eyes, and looked at his little pale face, and lifting him softly in my arms, put him into this book to rest. That is how he came to be here for you to know. But in the toy land, Apple Blossom waits with the wire spring in her breast, and the sawdust in her limbs, and at home, in the big house at the end of the village, the tall aunt weeps, 
and wails and wonders if she will ever see again the children she loves so well. She will not wait very long, dear children. I know how it will all be. When it is quite dark tonight, and she is sitting in the leather chair with the high back, her head on one side and her poor long neck aching, quite suddenly she will hear two voices shouting for joy. She will start up and listen, wondering how long she has been sleeping, and then she will call out, Oh, my darlings, is it you? And they will answer back, Yes, it is us, we have come, we have come. And before her will stand Willie and Apple Blossom, for the big doll will have run down, and the wire spring and the sawdust will have vanished, and Apple Blossom will be the doll's little girl no more. Then the tall aunt will look at them both and kiss them, and she will kiss the poor little goat too, wondering if it is possible to buy him a new tail. But though she will say little, her heart will sing for joy. Ah, children, there is no song that is sung by bird or bee, or that ever burst from the happiest lips, that is half so sweet as the song we sometimes sing in our hearts, a song that is learnt by love, and sang only to those who love us. End of Master Willie, as found in Very Short Stories and Verses for Children, by Mrs. W. K. Clifford. The Night of the Stolen Treasure Retold by Marie H. Frary and Charles M. Stebbins This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Hans and his mother were standing down by the Mummelsee. It was a big round sheet of water, surrounded by rocky slopes. On these grew dark pine trees, which cast their shadows far out into the water. The water lay quietly sleeping in its dark bed. The stillness made little Hans thoughtful, and he crept close to his mother. Why is the water so still? he whispered. And the fish, where are they? Listen, answered his mother, and I will tell you a story. There are no longer any fish in the Mummelsea. They left it many, many years ago. The place is haunted by Mummel, a great water god, and by his daughters, the beautiful water sprites. Long years ago, the mother went on, a man committed a great crime in order that he might get a rich treasure. In his flight, he came to the Mummelsea. He could not swim across with a bag of treasure. What should he do? He knew that he would be caught unless he did something at once. Ah, I will just drop it into the edge of the lake, he said to himself. The water is dark, and no one will be able to find the treasure. I will hide myself in the thick bushes, and there I will be safe also. He crawled into the bushes where they were thickest, but something was wrong. The bushes seemed like so many hands that caught hold of him and held him fast. He could not move. He struggled and struggled, but the more he fought against them, the more firmly they held on. He gave up the struggle and lay quiet, looking out upon the dark water. He saw something that was still more strange. What could it be? It looked like the form of a giant rising from the water. The face was sterner than any he had ever seen. What was it, mother? asked little Hans. Was it a ghost? It was Mummel the great angry god who haunts the lake. He had never allowed his peace to be disturbed in the slightest way. No one could throw even a pebble into the lake without being punished by him. Now he rose out of the water and seized the frightened man. 
the bushes let go their hold on him as if by magic and without saying a word the stern god began to sink down down into the cold black water oh cried hans was the man drowned no answered his mother he was not drowned the great god drew him down down to the bottom of the lake where he has a wonderful palace in it there are all kinds of strange creatures but what does the man do down there is he still alive yes mamma will not let him die but keeps him and makes him serve in the kitchen year after year and does he not have any rest or any holidays he does not need rest down there because he is no longer mortal like us but once a year he ceases for a single night to serve in the kitchen he becomes a mortal again and comes back to earth every year on the day on which he committed his crime he puts on his earthly clothes and comes up and when he reaches the world he suddenly finds himself at the place where he stole the treasure he hears someone coming and starts to flee with the treasure on his back each time he comes to the same spot on mummelsey and throws the sack into the lake just as before too he tries to hide in the bushes and is caught and held by them every year mummel angry as before comes up and drags the man out of the bushes and draws him down to his palace again many people have heard the strange noises in the bushes along the shore of the lake some of them imagine too that they have seen a strange form rising from the waters they declare that on this night the lake is greatly disturbed the wind is loud and the bushes bend their heads down to the very water on the night when these strange things happen people are careful to avoid the place although they like to go there at other times they would not wish to be found there on the night of the stolen treasure end of the night of the stolen treasure retold by marie h frary and charles m stebbins read by nemo the tale of peter rabbit by beatrix potter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. Once upon a time there were four little rabbits, and their names were Flopsy, Mopsy, Cottontail, and Peter. They lived with their mother in a sandbank, underneath the root of a very big fir tree now my dears said old mrs rabbit one morning you may go into the fields or down the lane but don't go into mr macgregor's garden your father had an accident there he was put in a pie by mrs macgregor now run along and don't get into mischief i am going out then old mrs rabbit took a basket and her umbrella to the baker's she brought a loaf of brown bread and five currant buns. Flopsy, Mopsy and Cottontail, who were good little bunnies, went down the lane to gather blackberries. But Peter, who was very naughty, ran straight away to Mr. MacGregor's garden and squeezed under the gate. First he ate some lettuces and some French beans, and then he ate some radishes and then, feeling rather sick, he went to look for some parsley. But round the end of a cucumber frame, whom should he meet but Mr. MacGregor? 
Mr. MacGregor was on his hands and knees, planting out young cabbages, but he jumped up and ran after Peter, waving a rake and calling out, Stop, thief! Peter was most dreadfully frightened. He rushed all over the garden, for he had forgotten the way back to the gate. He lost one of his shoes among the cabbages, and the other shoe amongst the potatoes. After losing them, he ran on four legs and went faster, so that I think he might have got away altogether if he had not, unfortunately run into a gooseberry net, and got caught by the large buttons on his jacket. It was a blue jacket with brass buttons, quite new. Peter gave himself up for lost, and shed big tears. But his sobs were overheard by some friendly sparrows, who flew to him in great excitement, and implored him to exert himself. Mr. MacGregor came up with a sieve, which he intended to pop over the top of Peter, but Peter wriggled out just in time, leaving his jacket behind him and rushed into the tool shed and jumped into a can. It would have been a beautiful thing to hide in if it had not had so much water in it. Mr. MacGregor was quite sure that Peter was somewhere in the tool shed, perhaps hidden underneath a flower pot. He began to turn them over carefully, looking under each. Presently Peter sneezed. Cashew! Mr. MacGregor was after him in no time, and tried to put his foot upon Peter, who jumped out of a window, upsetting three plants. The window was too small for Mr. MacGregor, and he was tired of running after Peter. He went back to his work. Peter sat down to rest. He was out of breath and trembling with fright, and he had not the least idea which way to go. Also, he was very damp with sitting in that can. After a time he began to wander about, going lippity-lippity, not very fast, and looking all around. He found a door in a wall, but it was locked, and there was no room for a fat little rabbit to squeeze underneath. An old mouse was running in and out over the stone doorstep, carrying peas and beans to her family in the wood. Peter asked her the way to the gate, but she had such a large pea in her mouth that she could not answer. She only shook her head at him. Peter began to cry. Then he tried to find his way straight across the garden, but he became more and more puzzled. Presently he came to a pond where Mr. MacGregor filled his water cans. A white cat was staring at some goldfish. She sat very, very still but now and then the tip of her tail twitched as if it were alive. Peter thought it best to go away without speaking to her. He had heard about cats from his cousin, little Benjamin Bunny. He went back towards the tool shed, but suddenly, quite close to him, he heard the noise of a hoe. Scritch, scratch, scratch, scritch. Peter scuttered underneath the bushes. But presently, as nothing happened, he came out and climbed upon a wheelbarrow and peeped over. The first thing he saw was Mr. MacGregor hoeing onions. His back was turned towards Peter, and beyond him was the gate. Peter got down very quietly off the wheelbarrow and started running as fast as he could go along a straight walk behind some black currant bushes. Mr. MacGregor caught sight of him at the corner but Peter did not care. He slipped underneath the gate and was safe at last in the wood outside the garden. Mr. MacGregor hung up the little jacket and the shoes for a scarecrow to frighten the blackbirds. Peter never stopped running or looked behind him till he got home to the big fir tree. He was so tired that he flopped down upon the nice soft sand on the floor of the rabbit hole and shut his eyes. His mother was busy cooking. She wondered what he had done with his clothes. It was a second little jacket and pair of shoes that Peter had lost in a fortnight. I am sorry to say that Peter was not very well during the evening. His mother put him to bed and made some chamomile tea, and she gave a dose of it to Peter. 
One tablespoonful to be taken at bedtime. But Flopsy, Mopsy and Cottontail had bread and milk and blackberries for supper. End of The Tale of Peter Rabbit by Beatrix Potter Recording by Peter Tomlinson The Prince and the Dragons by Tudor Jenks This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Prince and the Dragons by Tudor Jenks I am tired of all my toys, said the little prince, and besides, I've broken the trunk of my biggest wooden elephant. Has your royal highness thought of— Yes, I have, said the prince crossly, without waiting for the sentence to be finished. But you didn't know what I was going to say, objected the prince's tutor. Oh, yes, I did, said the prince, who was looking out of the palace windows. Well, what was it? asked the tutor. You were going to say, have you thought of studying your lessons for tomorrow? That's your idea of cheerful amusement, but it isn't mine. The prince's tutor was silent. What could he say? The prince had guessed exactly what the tutor would have asked, except for the interruption. So the tutor said no more, but began to whistle a tune. I wish you wouldn't do that, said the prince. It makes me nervous. I hate that tune, and I hate whistling. But you whistle sometimes, said the tutor. Not when I'm nervous, said the prince's reply. But what shall I do to amuse myself? Take a book, was the tutor's suggestion. What book? Oh, I don't know, any good book. But I'm tired of all the books I've read, and I don't want to begin a new one. Besides, I don't feel like reading. I'm too nervous. Nervous, exclaimed the tutor. The idea of a little boy's being nervous. You ought not have any nerves. Somebody's been talking nonsense to you. That's so, said the prince. Well, who is it? asked the tutor. It's you, was the prince's reply. In short, the little fellow was decidedly out of humor and felt like quarreling with the tutor simply because he was the nearest person. If it had been the king, he would have been snappish to the king. If it had been the queen, he would have whined at her. But as it was the tutor, a pale and thin young man with a high forehead, light straw-colored eyebrows, and spectacles, why, the prince was doing his best to make him angry. The tutor was used to this, and he did not let the prince bother him. When the prince became too bad-tempered, the tutor would go to one of the bookcases and take down a big fat volume entitled the History of Transcaucasian Enterprises under the auspices of the Committee on Extraterrestrial Immigration. Then he would bury his nose so deeply in between the pages that he couldn't hear a word the prince was saying. It was a great rest for the prince's tutor's mind. This is what he did now and was lost to the world. Count Brickabrack, said the prince, for that was his tutor's name. Hem, <laughs> was the only reply. So the prince had to leave Count Bricabrac to his interesting book. But the prince was bound to find some amusement. He began to look around his playroom at the various things hung on the walls. Suddenly, his eye brightened as he saw his favorite fishing pole hung upon the two golden hooks. He went across the room, pushed a rosewood table against the wall, and climbed upon it, scratching quite a number of marks on the polished top. He took down the pole, and then looked around for something for which to bait the hook. He saw the broken elephant lying near his Noah's Ark, for though this happened a long time ago, it was not before the flood, and the prince had Noah's Ark just like other little boys. He was going to fish in the moat that surrounded the palace walls, and he decided to use the wooden elephant for bait. It was some trouble to get the little elephant on the hook, but at length he succeeded in putting the hook through one of the ears which were made of felt, and then, going to the window, he flung out the end of the line and unreeled it until it reached the surface of the water far below. There it bobbed up and down in the sunshine while the prince waited for a bite. He did not have to wait long. 
Suddenly there was a commotion in the water. Something came rushing up from the depths and swallowed the wooden elephant. At once the line began to run out from the reel, and the prince, capering about, shouted, I've caught a fish! I've caught a fish! And he pulls like a big one! But Count Bricabrac paid no attention, for he was so deeply interested in his book. Then the prince began to haul in the line. The fish, or whatever was at the end of the line, pulled very hard. But the prince was a strong youngster and gradually drew in his catch. When it came to the top of the water, he suddenly saw that he had caught a young dragon, and a lively young creature it was, bright green with scarlet mouth, purple ears, and a lovely tail, all the colors of the rainbow. It was the first dragon the prince had ever seen. But he knew what it was because he had seen pictures of dragons in his favorite book of fairy tales. You might think that he would have cried out, but he was afraid that Count Bricabrac would not let him keep the little dragon, so he said nothing, but hauled it in as quick as he could. When the dragon felt itself coming out of the water, and then being dragged up the wall of the palace, it began to yowl. Count Bricabrac heard the noise, and for a moment looked up from his reading. Come, come, he exclaimed. You mustn't cry like that, a big boy like you. But the dragon didn't stop his noise. He was sorry that he had not left the wooden elephant alone, and made up his mind then and there never to touch elephant meat again. But this good resolution came too late, for the prince hauled the little captive in through the window, threw him flapping on the floor, and then dropping the pole, picked up the dragon, put him into his Noah's Ark, shut down the lid, and fastened it with the hook. Of course, the dragon kept up his howling all the time, and even Count Bricabrac noticed it. "'What is all this noise?' he asked, frowning severely. "'This whining must be stopped.' The prince was afraid his tutor would find out about the dragon, so he at once seated himself at his piano and began to practice his scales as loud and as fast as he could. This had two good effects. It drowned the noise of the dragon's wails, and it drove the tutor out of the room without his being able to take offense for of course he could not object to the prince's practicing without getting into trouble with the countess Metronomsky, who taught him music. So Count Bricabrac fled, slamming the door after him, and the prince was left alone with his dragon. After a few minutes, the prince shut the piano and opened the Noah's Ark. At once the dragon crawled out and began to jump about the floor. The little dragon was about as big as a half-grown puppy and seemed more frightened than fierce. Soon the prince noticed that the hook was sticking in the dragon's lower jaw and catching the scared creature, removed it. Then the dragon quieted down and soon allowed the prince to pat its head and showed its pleasure by purring like a big cat while its fiery little eyes glowed softly. After the hook was out, the dragon seemed very quiet, and before long began to blink its little eyes as if drowsy. This suited the prince exactly, for it was nearly supper time, and he was hungry. So he made up a cozy little nest for the dragon in the darkest corner of his playroom closet, using for the bedding several velvet doublets and cloaks of which the prince owned more than any sensible youngster could wear. The dragon coiled itself up like a crawler, and was soon fast asleep and snoring as comfortably as if it were at home, whereupon the prince went to supper as quietly as if he caught dragons every day in the week, and really there would be no story to tell if the little dragon had happened to be an orphan. But it had a strong, fierce mother, a lively, inquisitive father, several well-grown brothers and sisters, to say nothing of other relatives from cousins to granduncles, and they were all looking for the pretty little thing. The dragon had gone out for a quiet afternoon soaring when it had been chased by an eagle, had lost its way, and after flying till it was tired, had dropped into the moat of the palace. How the big dragons discovered where the little dragon was is not quite certain. Possibly they were told by a bothering old busybody of a bat that was blundering about just as the prince had hauled in the line. Certainly they found it out, for the prince's supper was not quite over when there came a sound of a great commotion outside of the palace, flapping and clapping of wings, 
scraping of claws, bellowing, yowling, howling, as if a thousand gentle nurses were washing a thousand cross boys all at once. The confusion was terrible. The guards who had been stationed on the towers and walls came running in to say that it was raining dragons, and every dragon was breathing out fire and lashing his tail. All the doors and windows were closed, and all the people in the palace wished they had always been good. The king, who had been busy playing checkers with the queen, did not for some time get a clear idea of what was going on. He was rather deaf, and at first thought the people were talking about wagons and gave orders for them to put them into the stable. Then he thought it was flagons and said, Oh, well then put them into the cellar. This is while they were all talking at once. But when it was a little quieter and the queen said distinctly, Not wagons or flagons, dear, but dragons. They say it's raining dragons. He pretty nearly understood, for he asked fiercely, who says we are raining dragons? Then the trouble was explained to him, and he was led to the window to see the great winged creatures dashing around and around. He said, Dear me, how interesting! Let me see, is there anybody in the palace who can talk dragon talk? Then all the courtiers and pages scampered upstairs and downstairs, repeating the king's question. When at last they had come to the room where the prince and his tutor were at supper, Count Brickerbrack said modestly that there was in the royal library a book about dragons, and that in the end there was a list of dragon words with a translation. He believed that by using this to aid him he could speak a little dragon talk, and what did the king want? Thereupon the pages grabbed him and ran him through the halls, up the stairs, bang into the presence of the king. Count Brickerbrack thinks he may make out the dragon talk, your majesty, they all bowed. Clearly enough, the deaf king understood. Is this true? he asked. Yes, sire, said the tutor, making a low bow. By aid of a small book that is in the royal library. Well, just step up to the door and see what is the meaning of this visit, said the king, ordering a page to fetch the book at once. If you don't mind, your majesty, may I speak to them through the window, shouted Count Bric-a-Brac in the king's ear. Certainly, certainly, the king agreed. Only find out what they want, and if possible, let them have it. We can't have the air full of dragons all the time. It doesn't seem healthy or quite safe. They might... At this moment there came a bang on the window's shutter, and then a scraping. Count Bric-a-Brac sprang to the shutter and threw it open, while everyone else in the room sidled away toward the opposite wall. As soon as the shutter was open, a dragon's head and long neck was thrust into the room. Count Bric-a-Brac thereupon turned over the pages of the handbook and soon began to address the dragon. <laughs> was his first remark. <laughs> said the dragon, smiling. It is useless to put down more of the conversation. The bright reader will already have seen that the dragon talk is only a kind of algebra. And who wants more algebra that comes naturally? The Count had to make his sentences up slowly, and it took a long time to find out the dragon's replies. But they understood each other in a way, and before very long Count Bric-a-Brac was able to report to the King the gist of the conversation. The dragons tell me, said the Count, that they have good reason to think that someone has captured a baby dragon and has shut it up somewhere about the palace. Nonsense! exclaimed the king. It is impossible! Which shows that even kings are now and then mistaken. At this moment the prince, having finished his supper, entered the room. He looked rather uneasy, for he had guessed what was the trouble, and had not made up his mind what to do. So he remained silent, waiting to see what would happen. I fear, said Count Bric-a-Brac, that there is no mistake. They are very keen scent, and they tell me that if you will admit a single dragon to the castle, it will be easy to find the missing youngster. What do you advise? the king remarked after a pause. I think, your serene highness, that there could be no objection to admitting a single dragon if it will promise not to breathe fire on furniture or scratch up the polished floors. 
But won't the dragon eat us? exclaimed old Duchess Darning Needle. No danger, said Count Brickerback without reflection. Dragons only care for the young and tender maidens. Now wasn't that a foolish speech? Of course it made the Duchess furious. And while she had never been fond of him, she disliked Count Brickerback more than ever afterward, and that brought him trouble. So it was decided to let one dragon enter the castle and make a careful search for the missing member of their family. The front gate was cautiously opened, and a great yellow dragon in spectacles. Maybe you didn't know they wore spectacles, but this one did. He had stolen them from an optician's shop, was allowed to crawl in. He was the father dragon, and at once began sniffing about to catch the scent, and soon caught it, for he immediately began to climb the winding stair that led to the prince's playroom. The whole court followed, but were exceedingly careful to keep clear of the monster's tail, the end of which was very sharp and went whisking about like a broken trolley wire. Straight to the prince's playroom went the big dragon, and when he reached the room, he went right to the door of the closet. Then the door was opened by Count Brickabrack, and in a moment more, the baby dragon was clasped in his father's arms. It was a touching scene, and many of the court were moved to tears. Soon afterward, the father dragon departed with his recovered darling, and when he reappeared at the palace gate, the dragons burst into a storm of cheering that sounded like the steam whistles that blow on the night before New Year's Day. Then, like a swarm of great birds, the whole flock of dragons rose into the air until they looked no bigger than crows, and away they flew over hill, dale, valley, and plain, until they were once more amid their mountainous peaks and crags. Then, settling into a nice flat rocky place, before a big cavern where they lived, they all sang their natural song, which runs thus. Dry desert is a view, region where plants are few, of you we howl. Come, all ye crawly things, proud of sharp crawls and stings, wave all your flapping wings, let dragons yowl. This and other verses they sang with great enthusiasm, and then dispersed about their regular nightly wrongdoing. Meanwhile, nothing particular was done at the palace, for the simple reason that it was bedtime, and everyone was so tired with the excitement about the dragons that all were very glad to get into their nice white nightgowns and cuddle down until the morning. That is, all but one. There was one who did not sleep. The Duchess Dawning Needle was very angry at what Count Brickabrack had said about her being in no danger because she was not young and tender. She didn't like Count Brickabrack anyway, as has been said, because he had succeeded her as the prince's teacher and had not liked the way she taught the prince his fractions. Altogether, as she thought it over, she became hopping mad, so mad she could not sleep. At length, she took a quill pen, and she wrote a little letter to an old witch of her acquaintance, who lived in a cave not far from the palace grounds. In this note, she told a horrid story. She said that it was Bric-a-Brac who had stolen the young dragon, and she told the witch to let the dragons know all about it. Of course, the witch did not know the note was not true. So, being able to speak the dragon language a little, she went to the head dragon of them all, the father of the little dragon, and told him that Count Brickabrack had captured the little one and that he ought to be punished for it. The old dragon thought this reasonable, and without telling any of the others what he meant to do, he quietly flew over to the palace, and hiding himself in the top of one of the tallest trees, awaited his chance to carry off the prince's tutor. He had not long to wait, for it was Bric-a-Brac's custom to walk in the palace gardens every afternoon before supper, reading some improving book. When the count came near to the tree, the father dragon swooped down like a hawk and bore Bric-a-Brac aloft. No one saw this capture except the wicked duchess, who was on the watch because she thought something of the sort might happen. 
When he felt himself lifted into the air, Count Bricabrac was quite startled and exclaimed, "'Goodness! This is really most unexpected and so sudden!' Then the Duchess leaned out of her tower window as the Count was carried by, and waved her lace handkerchief, said in a sneering and mocking tone, "'Oh, never mind, Count! Dragons only eat the young and tender!' Now wasn't that mean of her? But at last the Count knew by her remark who was to blame for his misfortune. He did not forget the Duchess's spitefulness. He was very clever, and he understood at once what the old woman had done. But he could not talk dragon language at all without the book in the library, and he wasn't reading that one. So he had to let himself be carried off. And to show you how cool and collected he was, he went on reading his book all the time Father Dragon was flying through the air, and never lost his place either. After Bricabrac's disappearance, the Duchess made up her mind to go and tell the King that the tutor had been carried off by a dragon, for she thought that if she was the first to give the alarm, no one would suspect that she was to blame. So the Duchess Darning Needle put all her false curls into the greatest disorder, and pretending great grief, rushed into the palace hall, and cried out as, as if in deepest distress, "'Oh, me! Oh, my! That charming and sweet Count Bricabrac! Oh, oh, oh! What shall we do? Oh, oh!' Of course, everybody came clustering about to know what terrible thing had happened. But she only caterwauled the louder, and pulled at her curls until she tore some out, which— as they were false, didn't hurt her at all. She made as much noise as two pigs under a gate, and nobody could get a word out of her until the king came in. But he wouldn't stand for her nonsense, not for a minute. He told her to hush, and then shook her till her teeth rattled. This quieted her, and then the king made her tell what had happened, and be quick about it, too. Oh, exclaimed the duchess. It's the big dragon that was here on Friday, and he has carried off his little royal highness's tutor, the noble Count Bricabrac. And to think he should become food for the horrid dragons up there in the mountains, isn't it terrible? The king was shocked, of course. So would any man be, on hearing that his son's only tutor had been carried away by the chief of a whole race of dragons. But though naturally a little uneasy, the king gave proper orders at once. He directed that a handsome reward should be offered for the Count's return uninjured, and at the same time summoned all his wisest counsellors to hold a grand meeting to devise diverse and sundry ways and means for taking such measures as would accomplish something toward the Count's release. What else could any ruler do? But there was one member of the court who decided that there was something else to be done. The little prince was not at all thoughtless only naughty. He felt that if anyone was to blame for the fate of Count Bricabrac, it was himself. It was he who had fished for the little dragon with the toy elephant, and now that his tutor was paying the penalty, the prince could not rest. Of course, he should have gone to his father just as George Washington did in the cherry tree case, but George had not happened at that early date, and so how could the prince know what to do? What he did was to pack a few clothes into a satchel, help himself to some chocolate cake and macaroons out of the royal pantry, and set off for the home of the dragons. No doubt this was very imprudent, but it was brave, and not many small boys of his age would have done it. Luckily, no one saw him climb over the palace gate, and except for slightly tearing his silk hose, all went well. It was a long walk up the mountains, but the prince climbed on behind a wagon for part of the way, and he reached the dragonland before nightfall. Here he met a sentinel, a rather stylish young dragon, who asked him his business. The prince replied politely, but as neither could speak the other's language, the remarks did not fit very well. The conversation was something like this. "'What do you want here?' asked the dragon in his language. "'From the king's palace, I'm the prince,' was the reply in the prince's language. 
I don't understand. Can't you speak dragon language? To rescue Count Bricabrac, said the prince firmly. What is a little boy like you doing out all alone? Was the dragon's next question. I alone am to blame, said the prince. For I caught the little dragon. I came to surrender myself. I can't understand a word you say, said the dragon. Count Brickerbrack had nothing to do with it, the prince went on. Now this was the second time Brickerbrack's name had been said, and the dragon had heard it before. Brickerbrack, though he had been a prisoner but a few hours, was already learning the language a little, and had told the dragons his name. The sentinel, therefore, decided that the boy's visit had something to do with the captive, and led the way up the rocky road. But seeing the prince was tired, he kindly stooped down and made signs for the little fellow to climb upon his back. This the brave prince did, and a few moments of rapid flight brought them to the dragon's settlement. Here the prince was delighted to find his tutor seated beside the chief dragon, trying to teach the alphabet out of the one book he had carried away. The two friends greeted each other warmly, and after a few moments the prince explained why he had came. "'I cannot tell a lie, Count bric he said. "'I did it with my little wooden elephant. You must go free.' "'My dear boy,' exclaimed the tutor, "'I'd rather you had caught a hundred young dragons than to have told a falsehood, but I cannot allow you to take my place.' "'But I must,' said the prince. "'Let me tell the dragons at once that you are innocent.' "'You can't do it,' objected the tutor. "'And I can't either, for I haven't the handbook. "'We don't know how to speak the language. "'You will have to wait until I taught the dragons to speak ours.' "'That might take some time,' the prince remarked. "'It may,' Count Brickabrack admitted. For so far the old dragon has learned only four letters of the alphabet. A, C, D, B, the dragon remarked proudly as he heard the word alphabet. Very nearly correct, said the tutor. A, B, C, D, we say. A, B, C, D, the dragon repeated with great cleverness. Exactly, Count bric -a agreed, patting the big dragon on the head, for he was proud of his pupil. Then he went on to the prince. You see, we are very good friends. The dragons had an idea of eating me at first, but provisions are plenty just now, and I got them interested in learning. I believe we are safe for the present. Sit down and let me finish the lesson. So the prince sat down and listened to the Count's efforts to teach the big dragon to read. After the lesson was over, Count bric -a explained by signs that the prince and he were good friends and the dragons good-naturedly left them together. The prince brought out his chocolate cake and he and his tutor ate their supper, saving the macaroons for breakfast, afterwards retiring to a cleft in the rocks where Count bric -a was lodged. Meanwhile, there was a great to-do at the palace the prince's absence was discovered, and everybody thought the dragons had carried him away. The king and his counselors held another meeting and decided to offer more rewards. The reward for the prince was enormous, and when the Duchess Darning Needle had read the king's proclamation, she decided to try to win the great prize for herself. Putting on a thick black veil and wrapping herself in a long cloak, she stole out one dark night and went to talk the matter over with her friend, the witch. This queer old woman was in her cave frying donuts, and she was not well pleased to see a visitor being very greedy and wanting all the three dozen donuts for herself. As for the Duchess, she was especially fond of donuts, and the smell of them made her mouth water so she could hardly speak plainly. "'Good evening, Mother Black.' said the duchess very politely. You seem to be busy cooking something. Yes, I am, said the old witch. Only a bit of something for my supper. Nothing very nice, nothing very nice. 
It smells like doughnuts, said the Duchess with a grin. She meant for a sweet smile. You seem to make very nice ones. Good enough for a toothless old thing like me, said the witch. I should like to taste one, said the Duchess eagerly. But it is witch food, said Mother Black, and I'm afraid you wouldn't like it. Besides, I only have a few. The Duchess knew better, for there were at least two dozen already cooling in the witch's table. So she rose and walked toward the delicious brown rings. This made the old witch frantic, and waving her crutch in the air, she warned the Duchess away from her dainties. Stand back, she cried. Don't touch them. They're poisoned. Poisoned, said the Duchess. But you said they were for your supper. I think you are mistaken, said Mother Black shortly. The Duchess, however, was not deceived, though she decided to let the doughnuts alone, for she wished to keep the witch in good humor. She therefore told all about the big reward offered by the king for the rescue of the prince and his tutor, proposing that she and the witch should win it for themselves. The old witch eagerly agreed, and they began to make plans. None seemed good until the Duchess announced that she had a bright idea. Let us send the dragons the poison doughnuts, she exclaimed, and then, when they are all dead, the prince and Count Brickabrack can be rescued without danger. But, the witch objected, these doughnuts won't poison dragons. They are not that kind. And besides, you don't want to poison the prince and the count, do you? No. The Duchess admitted with a grin. At least not the prince. Perhaps you could put something in a new batch of doughnuts to make them all sleep. And while they're all sleeping, we can carry off their captives. How would that do? There seems no objection to that. Excellent, cried the witch. I will make some of the sort of doughnuts dragons all love, and dose them with the juice of an herb that will make them sleep. And there you are. Then we can divide the reward, can we not, dear Duchess? Certainly we can, the Duchess answered. And now, do you think all the doughnuts are poisoned? They seem so nicely browned. There are perhaps two or three that won't hurt you, I'm sure, the witch replied, being now in better humor. And soon the two wicked old creatures sat down to a nice dish of crisp doughnuts that were much too good for them and plotted to secure the big reward. It took several days, it may be a week or more, for Mother Black to prepare the great batch of dosed doughnuts, and during those days Count Bric-a-Brac and the Prince worked hard in teaching the dragons their language, so hard that by the time the doughnuts were all done and dosed, the dragons, or at least a few of them, could talk a little with their captives. But these days of schooling kept the dragons so busy that they had not much time for hunting, and food ran short. In all those days they caught only two elephants, four tigers, and one old camel, and that was very little among so many. Being hungry, the ruder dragons began to look eagerly at the two captives, who had grown plump because of their helpful life in the open air. If you had been a dragon, they would have looked as appetizing to you as two nice round chocolate creams. Of course, the other educated dragons, who had been part way through the primer, had too much respect for their teacher to think of him as food. But the others grumbled, saying learning was well enough in its way when one had plenty to eat. But what good were reading, writing, and arithmetic to a dragon when he was starving? Just as things were looking rather dangerous for the two captives, there arrived a dozen boxes of delicious and delectable doughnuts, addressed to the Honorable Dragons of Dragonville, from a sincere friend who prefers to remain unknown. When the box was opened, the dragons began to sing, saying it was a dainty gift fit to please a king, for the doughnuts were a lovely sealskin brown and done just as dragons like their doughnuts done. The famished dragons begged that the dainties might be at once distributed, but just then Count Bric-a-Brac rushed amid the throng. He had guessed at once that there was something wrong, 
and desired to warn his friends. Of course, he had to speak in primer language, so his speech went something like this. The dragon must not eat the donut. The donut will make the dragon sick. It is not a friend who sent the box. A bad one sent the box. It is not a wise dragon who eats the bad donut. Shut the box and do not eat the donut. Though his manner was earnest, he made little impression and all insisted upon eating the dosed donuts except the big dragon, who loved his teacher, and pretty soon it was evident something was wrong. One by one, all who had eaten the fateful donuts fell fast asleep, the greediest first. And by evening, all were asleep and snoring like distant thunderstorms, excepting the old father dragon, Count bric -brac, and the little prince. The three held a hasty consultation, and by the Count's advice, they pretended to be asleep too. And about midnight, all was very still but the snoring chorus. Then there stole into Dragonland the Duchess Darning Needle and the old witch, driving a donkey cart in which they meant to carry home the captives whom they expected to find sleeping. But when they entered the cave where lay Father Dragon and the two captives, imagine the surprise and disgust of these wicked old creatures to see Father Dragon rise in wrath with fiery eyes and bristling tail, while Count bric -brac and the Prince also sprang up to confront the Duchess and the Witch. "'Disgraceful dosers of donuts!' exclaimed the Count. "'Now you will receive the reward of your crimes. Fall upon your knees and repent.' For by consent of Father Dragon, a true and gentle friend, and a bright scholar, we depart at once for the palace, uninjured. You will remain as his prisoners, and though your age and toughness may save your lives, you will probably never be permitted to leave this land, but will pass the rest of your days in frying harmless, undosed donuts for the whole Dragon Nation who have almost resolved to give up eating all animal food. It is a just punishment, and I hope it will be borne with such patience as you may have. Then, bidding Father Dragon farewell, he and the prince departed. What was the fate of the two wicked plotters cannot be told with any certainty, for nothing more was ever heard of them. It may be in spite of their resolution and of the new donuts, the dragons ate them both up, but whatever happened to them, they richly deserved it. As for Count bric -brac and his little pupil, they had a pleasant little walk down the mountain through beautiful views that were not noticed by the tutor, because he read his book all the way. They were received with joy at the palace, and the large reward was paid to them because they had found themselves. The king gave a splendid banquet in honor of the return, and the queen let the prince sit up all through the dessert. So the prince's fishing in the moat ended quite happily for him. But his visit to the dragons had an excellent effect, for seeing how the oldest dragon studied his primer taught the prince to value Count bric brac services. And he became a very good scholar indeed, getting marks of from ninety to a hundred nearly every day. Even that was not all, for several years afterward it happened that a most beautiful princess was carried off by a rather bold young dragon, and the princess's father offered half his kingdom and the hand of his daughter in marriage to any brave young prince who could bring her safely back. Count bric brac who was still with his royal master, advised the young prince to attempt the feat and offered to accompany him in the perilous adventure thinking his knowledge of dragon talk might be useful. When they had made their way to the dragon's cave, the dragon came out with a terrifying roar, crying, <laughs> which means, If you don't get away from here, you'll be sorry. But Count bric brac replied very politely in dragon language, and after a few minutes' conversation, it came out that this was the very same dragon that Prince had fished for so long ago. And then everything was soon arranged. 
the princess was politely dismissed with an apology and rode home behind the prince on his spirited black charger to the delight of the whole kingdom who were amazed and overcome by the beauty and valor of her rescuer as well as by his modesty and then why then of course they were married in the great cathedral and the bells rang the cannons roared all the schools were closed for a week there were fireworks every night all the theaters were free people could walk on the grass in the parks and there were parades with brass bands in all the principal streets and among the beautiful wedding presents one of the most attractive was a large golden vase full of the most delicious doughnuts and on the vase was an inscription showing that it was from the dragons of Dragonville, with their best wishes for the happiness of their royal highnesses, the prince and the princess. The vase was much admired, and the doughnuts were highly appreciated as long as they lasted. After which, the young prince and his beautiful bride lived happily until they came into the throne, and then they were beloved by their subjects during a reign that lasted, oh, ever so long. End of The Prince and the Dragons by Tudor Jenks Read by Major Toast The Sultan's Verses by Tudor Jenks This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In a land so far to the east that it is very warm when the sun rises, and quite chilly at sunset, a great sultan died. His successor happened to be a nephew who lived at some distance, so far away, even from that distant land, that he wasn't at all intimate with the late sultan. In fact, they had only met half a dozen times, at Thanksgiving dinners or similar occasions and consequently the new sultan shed no tears to quench his joy upon coming to the throne. He decided to rule wisely and justly, and therefore was eager to choose the most trustworthy advisers. When he arrived at his capital, he was conducted at once to the palace, and spent the first day or two in resting from his journey, and making the acquaintance of his courtiers, and buying becoming clothes. Among these courtiers was the vizier of the late sultan, a very gentlemanly old fellow, whose turban and beard were never more impressive than on first meeting. When the sultan arose late on the third day, he had decided to begin his reign. So he sent for the old vizier to have a private conversation with him in the throne room both sat down cross-legged in an attitude that would give American citizens the cramps, and the sultan opened the little powwow thus. Saleh ben Rifraf, I think it is high time that I, that is, that we, begin our reign. Wisdom is heard, replied Rifraf, with the ease and indifference of an old courtier. And it strikes me, uh, us, the sultan went on, that it is an excellent opportunity for me to have our own way about several little matters that have long been in my mind. Your will is the people's law, was Riff Raff's safe answer, as he bowed like a china image. So I understand, the sultan assented. Of course we shall for a while carry on business upon the usual lines, so far as public affairs are concerned, but it's not to public business that we are referring just now. Why, indeed, remarked Riff Raff a little vaguely, as the sultan paused, for he was thinking of something else, but so was the young sultan. So I say, the sultan replied, now, so far as my own private affairs are concerned, I mean to have my own way about them. Yes? Yes. For instance, I have long desired to be a poet, said the sultan, looking aimlessly at the ceiling. 
The vizier started so abruptly that his turban fell off, and then he too looked at the ceiling, until the sultan should choose to go on. It was a very embarrassing situation. In all the vizier's experience, nothing like this had ever presented itself. The old sultan had been a very sensible man, according to the vizier's opinion, and had considered poetry, well, he hadn't considered it at all. There was a silence that lasted until the bulbul in the blue room had finished a long ditty. Then the vizier saw it was his move, so to speak, and he took refuge in a proverb, the first that occurred to him. Cheerfulness is perfectly consistent with piety, he said, shaking his head thoughtfully. So we think, said the sultan, and we shall therefore allow you to conduct the realm about as usual for a short time, while we devote ourselves to poetry. Hug, exclaimed the vizier, for he couldn't help it. Excuse me, said the sultan inquiringly. Every condition sits well upon a wise man, remarked Riff Raff, who was fond of proverbs, especially when he didn't care to commit himself. But, though that is all plain sailing, Sultan went on again, after trying a moment in vain to see what the proverb had to do with the subject. There is yet some difficulty, that is, to find a competent critic who will show me my faults and point out any little errors that may creep into my hasty lines. Now, if you yourself, Ben Riffraff, should prefer to undertake this responsible post, you can do so. My sovereign master said Riffraff hastily. I am an old man. Let me care for the realm, for that trade I have long studied. I would prefer that another should become your critic and poetical adviser, a younger man. So be it, answered the young sultan. But let me at least read to you one set of verses, which I happen to find in my kaftan. I would like your judgment upon these lines before you betake yourself to your proper duties. Shall it be so? The vizier saw by the look in the sultan's eye that the request was a command, and he replied in oriental phrase that he was most honored by the sultan's condescension. So the young sultan drew out a roll of manuscript and read as follows. Youth is the season for hope. Hope befitteth the young. Youth has the vigor to cope with the woes that the singers have sung. Youth has the sparkle of mirth. Laughter delighteth the soul. Spring is the youth of the earth. Merrily let carols roll. The sultan rolled up his manuscript and looked expectantly at Ben Riffraff. "'What do you think of that?' asked the sultan. "'Give me your candid opinion, as one private gentleman might to another.' Now the vizier thought the lines were very poor indeed, but he had often heard that poets were sensitive, and he therefore believed he was doing a very wise thing when he replied, "'Oh, your highness!' What thought, what music! How exquisite your rhymes! Soul and roll! Why, it's a perfect rhyme! I think you have chosen wisely indeed, if I may be permitted to praise without the suspicion of flattery. Then you really like the little lines, said the Sultan with a smile, a peculiar smile. Like them? Why, they should be embroidered with gold thread on silken scarves. Your Highness is right. You are a poet. Let me attend to the petty business of governing, and you can give yourself entirely to the sublime art of composition. So be it, said the Sultan. Until I notify you to the contrary, I will leave the reins in your hands. Now, as you will have plenty to attend to, will you kindly summon the chief treasurer as you go out? Thank you. Good morning. The vizier salaamed and vanished through the curtained doorway, and the page on duty outside noticed that the old vizier wore a broad grin as he walked down the arched corridor. 
In a few minutes the sultan heard the jingling of the golden curtain rings, and he beheld the face of the chief treasurer, a sedate and dignified man of middle age. "'Enter, Adam el Shekels,' said the sultan kindly, "'and be seated. I would confer with you. "'My lord, the treasury is well supplied, and the accounts straight. "'No doubt,' interrupted the sultan, "'but I have more important matters.' "'More important?' the treasurer began, so amazed that he forgot his manners. "'Verily,' said the sultan, overlooking the little breach of etiquette, "'as the vizier has no doubt informed you, "'I intend to devote my own time, for the present, to poetry. "'He told you so, did he not?' Uh, "'Something of the sort, your highness,' replied el Shekels uneasily hoping that the sultan wouldn't ask him to repeat the vizier's joking remarks. In fact, the vizier had hinted that the young sultan thought himself a genius. I suspected as much, and you were surprised, perhaps. Your highness is the ruler, responded the treasurer politely, but I was surprised, I admit, and to tell the truth, if you will pardon me for saying so, I must say that, as a rule, there isn't much money to be made in poetry. I speak simply as a treasurer, your highness, not as a critic. But I wish your opinion as a critic, the sultan answered. The question of providing funds I shall leave to you, for the present, unless I should appoint you to a new office, I mean to create. That of chief critic and poetical advisor, the face of al had brightened when the new office was mentioned, but the brightness faded as the sentence ended. Your Highness is most gracious, but if it be your will, I prefer to remain treasurer. As you please, the Sultan replied, but meanwhile I happen to have in my kaftan a copy of verses that I have just completed. If you can spare the time, we shall be glad to have your opinion of them. Most certainly, gracious sovereign, was the answer of el -Shakel's while his face assumed a weary expression, and he began to do sums in mental arithmetic. So drawing forth the precious manuscript, the sultan began, Youth is the season for hope. And on he went reading in a fine declamatory voice, as if trying to bring out the best points of the verses. When he concluded, he looked at the chief treasurer, Your Highness, the lines are above praise said the treasurer. I hardly know which part to praise most. And that was true, for he hadn't paid very close attention. But I am sure your wisdom has led you aright. Your talents are far beyond my poor criticism. Let another be your chief critic. I am content to remain treasurer. It shall be as you say, the sultan agreed. At least for the present. And as you go out, will you be kind enough to send us the, uh, what officer comes next to you in rank? The Minister of Justice, answered the Treasurer. Yes, I will see that he comes at once. Well, remarked the page at the door, the new Sultan certainly makes the officers happy. How they do grin when they come back. Later in the afternoon, the page had reason to repeat this remark with added emphasis, for meanwhile he had admitted the greatest officers of the realm, and all, as they came from their interview with the young sovereign, were adorned by the same self-satisfied grimace. Stronger and stronger became the page's curiosity to know what it was that made all the courtiers so well satisfied with themselves. For after the first two or three had exclaimed to the rest that the young sultan thinks he's a genius in the poetry line, and all you got to do is praise his verses and you're sure to keep your place. It was as easy as rolling off a log to go in, hear the verses, and express your raptures, and come out in clover. But no one told the page about all this, and his curiosity about the interviewers became very keen. He thought there must be something worth seeing in the throne room. Not long after each great official entered, he could hear a murmur of voices and then such expressions as, Exquisite! Beautiful! Or Perfect! 
Couldn't be better. Well, well, I never did. Never was anything like it. Strangely enough, the page's curiosity was gratified most unexpectedly. It was getting late, and the sultan had seen all the prominent officials of the palace. At length he came to the doorway and found the page sitting in attendance on rather a thin and hard cushion. "'Why, my boy,' said the sultan kindly, "'you must be worn out. Have you been there all day?' "'All day, your majesty,' the page replied respectfully. "'And since your majesty asks me, I am a little tired.' "'Come in,' said the sultan, holding aside the curtain. "'You shall rest a while.' "'What? With your majesty in the throne room?' The boy exclaimed in amazement, "'Certainly. No one need know,' answered the sultan kindly. "'Are you afraid of me?' "'No, your majesty,' said the page, for the sultan smiled very cordially. And the page entered the throne room. "'Be seated,' said the sultan. "'I command it,' he added, as the boy hesitated. So the page sat down upon a soft silk cushion. "'I have been writing some verses,' said the sultan, and he bade the boy help himself to the delicious fruits and ices. "'And while you refresh yourself, I should like to read them to you.' "'Your majesty is very kind,' said the page. "'But suppose someone should come?' "'No one will come,' said the sultan decidedly, and he clapped his hands, summoned a slave, and bade him stand sentinel to keep out all intruders.' So, while the boy enjoyed the fruits and ices, the sultan, for the twentieth time at least, read aloud his precious lines on youth. When he had finished, he turned to the page, saying, Now I should like your opinion of the poem. But, your highness, I am too young to criticize your verses, replied the page uneasily. All nonsense, answered the sultan, but pleasantly enough. I see you have an opinion. I desire you to express it freely. Nay, more than that, I command you to do so. I must obey, then, said the page, looking very serious. But if I should incur your majesty's displeasure, may I beg that you will visit your wrath upon me alone. I have a mother and sister who are dependent upon me. They shall be cared for, said the sultan in a solemn tone, if the need arises. "'But you make me suspect that my lines do not meet with your approval.' "'On your own head be it, commander of the faithful,' exclaimed the unhappy page. "'By the prophet, as I promised my mother that I would tell truth, "'the lines are the various bosh and nonsense. "'They mean nothing. They do not even sound sensible.' They are as unmusical as the braying of a lost donkey. There. I have said the truth. A man dies but once. Remember then your words. Allah be praised, cried the sultan. I have found a pearl, and all the men of my court declared the lines perfect beyond praise. Now have I found the honest man I sought. But your majesty, stammered the astonished page, I... I am no more than a boy. Enough, said the sultan. The years will find you wisdom as well as age. But honesty comes not even with long ages, if the seed be not already planted. Say not a word. The sultan clapped his hands, directed all the courtiers to be summoned, and in their presence appointed the page, chief counselor and grand high vizier of the realm for life at the same time investing him with the order of the golden sunburst of the east and a whole row of smaller decorations of different colors. When the ceremony was over, Saleh Ben Rifraf prostrated himself before the throne. "'Speak, Ben Rifraf,' said the sultan. "'Would your majesty deign to inform his humble slaves what has caused the merited elevation of his favorite?' Ben Rifraf inquired. Most willingly, responded the sultan. I read my verses to this youth, and he has given upon them the wisest judgment of you all. But words cannot say more than we said, 
Ben Rifra ventured to say. Did we not praise your highness's genius? Most, Most true. true. Oh, oh so Sultan. the truth you did, replied the Sultan. Yet were the verses the various trash as we well knew. Most true, O oh, Sultan, came the chorus from the whole court, for they saw the tide had turned. And courage to tell this truth was found only in my page, whom I have made chief counselor. Enough. The audience is at an end. Then, just before the band struck up an inspiring march, the voice of Bin Refraf was heard reciting a well-known proverb, which in its original Arabic looks like a procession of earthworms, but which means in plain English, after wit is everybody's wit. End of The Sultan's Verses by Tudor Jenks Read by Major Toast. The Duck Pond by Mrs. W. K. Clifford. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Duck Pond by Mrs. W. K. Clifford. So little Bridget took the baby on her right arm and a jug in her left hand and went to the farm to get the milk. On her way she went by the garden gate of a large house that stood close to the farm and she told the baby a story. Last summer, she said, a little girl bigger than you, for she was just able to walk, came to stay in that house, she and her father and mother. All about the road just here, the ducks and the chickens from the farm and an old turkey used to walk about all the day long, but the poor little ducks are very unhappy, for they had no pond to swim about in, only that narrow ditch through which the streamlet is flowing. When the little girl's father saw this, he took a spade and worked and worked very hard, and out of the ditch and the streamlet he made a little pond for the ducks, and they swam about and were very happy all through their summer days. Every morning I used to stand and watch, and presently the garden gate would open, and then the father would come out, leading the little girl by the hand, and the mother brought a large plateful of bits of broken bread. The little girl used to throw the bread to the ducks, and they ran after it and ate it up quickly, while she laughed out with glee, and the father and the mother laughed too, just as merrily. Baby, the father had blue eyes and a voice that you seemed to hear of your heart. The little girl used to feed the chickens too, and the foolish old turkey that was so fond of her it would run after her until she screamed and was afraid. The dear father and the little girl came out every morning while the black pigs looked through the bars of the farmyard gate and grunted at them as if they were glad. And I think the ducks knew that the father had made the pond for they swam round and round it proudly while he watched them, but when he went away they seemed tired and sad. The pond is not there now, baby, for a man came by one day and made it into a ditch again, and the chickens and the ducks from the farm are kept in another place. The little girl is far away in her own home, which the father made for her, and the dear father lives in his own home too, in the hearts of those he loved. That was the story that Bridget told the baby. End of The Duck Pond by Mrs. W. K. Clifford Read by Ruth The Water Sprites Retold by Marie H. Frary and Charles M. Stebbins This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Mummel, the great angry water god, has many beautiful daughters. These he guards jealously, and will allow no one to see them in their maiden forms, except by the dim moonlight. These beautiful water nymphs are not at all like their stern father. They are pure and gentle and graceful and kind they never do harm to anyone and are not displeased 
if people come to visit the lake indeed they like to have people come to see them dance upon the water at night these lovely creatures would gladly help people if their father did not guard them so jealously for they are kind-hearted and generous as it is all they can do for mortals is to entertain them with their fairy dances on the silvery waters of mummelsea on every moonlight night they can be seen flitting about on the surface of that their fairy forms are so charming that people who see them cannot help forgetting their daily cares people come to the lake tired and careworn in the evening and go away happy and cheerful all night long till the first streaks of dawn the fairy nymphs can be seen flitting charmingly from wave to wave their gowns are light and flowing like gossamers their beautiful golden hair too floats lightly on the gentle breeze once or twice it is said daring youths have been drawn by their beauty and have ventured into the lake to meet them every attempt however has been disastrous mummel has caught the intruder and taken him down to his abode below the lake there the unhappy youth has had to act as a servant whenever anyone attempts to come too close to his daughters too mummel takes away their human shapes at once he transforms them into water lilies and makes them stand with bowed heads along the farther shore of the lake every morning too as soon as the first light of day begins to appear the beautiful figures leave their fairy dance upon the lake mummel transforms them into their lily forms and makes them stand in the water along the shore so the beautiful water lilies which are to be seen in mummelsea are the lovely water sprites daughters of mummel no one is allowed to pick one even to this day end of the water sprites retold by marie h frary and charles m stebbins read by nemo how the white man came by mabel powers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org long long before columbus came to america the red children were here they were the first and only real americans from the big sea water on the east to the big sea water on the west ranged these children of the sun as they called themselves happy and free as the sunlight and air about them they ran through wide forests all their own or plied their bark canoes up and down the streams then the indian had a dream this was long before columbus dreamed his dream of the western world in his dream the indian saw a great white bird coming out of the east its wings were stretched wide to the north and south with great strength and speed it swept toward the setting sun in fear and wonder the indian watched this giant white bird appear and disappear he knew its meaning and the indian's heart was sad then the white man came from the big sea water on the east he came in his great white winged canoe with one hand pointing to the great spirit and with the other extended to the red man he came he asked for a small seat the seat the size of a buffalo skin would be quite large enough for him he said in the name of the great spirit the red children greeted the white man and called him brother they gave him the seat he asked they gave him a large buffalo skin also and showed him where he could spread it by their council fire the white man took the buffalo skin he thanked his red brother in the name of the great spirit then he began to cut the skin into many many small strips when the whole buffalo skin had been cut into narrow strips he tied the strips together they made a long cord that would reach over a long trail in amazement the indians watched the white man while he measured off a seat as long and as broad as this cord would reach around the small seat the size of a buffalo skin became a tract of land soon the white man asked for another seat this time his seat took in the indians lodges and a campfire he asked the indians if they would move on a few arrow flights this they did then the white man wanted another seat each time it took a larger skin for him to sit upon 
This time the skin stretched so far that it covered a part of the Indians' hunting and fishing grounds. Again the Indians moved on. Again the white men followed. Each time his seat grew larger, until the Indian had a place but the size of a buffalo skin on which to sit. Thus it was that the white man came, like a great white bird that swept from the big sea water on the east to the big sea water on the west, the white man came, and he drove the Indian from the rising to the setting sun. End of How the White Man Came by Mabel Powers Read by Josh Kibbe The Wonderful Ring, an East Indian Story by Catherine Pyle This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. There was once a king who had two sons. The elder was a very stingy prince. He would neither give nor lend to anyone. The younger, on the contrary, was a waster, who could never say no to anyone, and spent all he had without ever taking thought of the morrow. In time, the old king died, leaving everything he had to his sons, without making any division between them. The elder was very much dissatisfied with this arrangement. Come, he said to his brother, let us divide between us what our father left. Then you can squander your share as you please, but I intend to save mine, for I have no idea of being brought to poverty. The younger brother readily agreed to this. They divided the inheritance between them, but somehow, in the division, the elder one seemed to get the best of everything. The younger did not quarrel over that, however. After that they separated, and each one lived his own life as he wished. The elder saved and hoarded as was his nature, and grew richer every day. But the younger spent with a free hand, and denied neither himself nor his friends anything. After a while the younger prince had spent all he had, and then he journeyed to the palace where his elder brother lived to ask help of him. The older prince was but ill-pleased to see him. So, you have already wasted all your money, said he. I knew it would be so. This one time I will help you, because you are the son of our father. But in return, you must promise you will never come here again to trouble me. The young prince was obliged to agree to this, and the elder then gave him four pieces of golden money, no more, no less. With this the young prince was obliged to be content, though it was little enough to live on. He went away from his brother's palace, and he had not journeyed far when he met a man carrying a cat, and the cat was so thin and miserable looking that it was pitiful. "'Is your cat for sale?' asked the prince. "'Yes, it is,' answered the man. "'And what is the price of it?' "'I can only sell it for gold, for it is a very fine cat.' "'Very well,' said the prince. "'I will buy it and he paid the man one of the pieces of money his brother had given him. He went a little farther on, and he met a man with a dog, and the dog was no less miserable looking than the cat. The prince felt pity for it. "'Is your dog for sale?' he asked. "'Yes, I will sell it.' "'How much do you ask for it?' "'I will sell it for a piece of gold money.' The prince gave the man a second of his pieces of money and took the dog in exchange." A little while after, he saw a merchant with a parrot, and then a fakir with a snake, and both of these creatures he also bought, because he thought they looked as though they were ill-treated, and now his money was all gone. "'My poor friends,' said the prince, "'I had meant to do you a good turn by buying you, but now I have no food for either myself or you. It seems you are worse off than ever.' "'Do not let that trouble you, dear prince,' said the snake." My father, who lives over in the jungle beyond the city, is the king and ruler over all the serpents. He is very rich and powerful. Let us go to him, and he will gladly reward you for saving me from the fakir, for he was a very cruel man. This advice sounded good to the prince. He at once set out into the jungle, and the snake directed him which way to go. The dog and the cat followed close behind, and the parrot fluttered from branch to branch overhead. After traveling for some time, the prince and his companions came to a great heap of ruins, and here the snake bade them pause. This is where my father lives, says he. Do you wait here while I go forward and prepare him for your visit? If you came upon him suddenly, he might strike you before I had time to tell him who you were, and you might die. Very well, said the prince, do you go, and I and the others will wait here until you return. 
The snake at once slipped away among the ruins, and it was not long before he returned. "'My father will now see you,' he said. "'He is very grateful to you for saving me from the fakir, and will offer to reward you with all sorts of treasures, but you must refuse them. Ask him for the little old ring he wears, and take nothing else, for it is worth more than all the rest of his riches put together.' The prince promised to do as the snake bade him, and then followed it through the ruins until they came to the large gilded and painted chamber where the serpent king lived. This serpent king was of enormous size and wore a golden crown upon his head. After he had heard his son's story, he made the prince welcome and began to thank him for what he had done for his son. "'You have saved him from a miserable life,' said he. "'I am not ungrateful, and I intend to reward you.' In my treasure chamber are riches beyond all dreaming. Take as much of them as you choose. I grudge you nothing, and there is nothing you can ask of me that I will not give you. I thank you, answered the prince, but I have no need of treasures, and it was from pity that I bought your son, and not for a reward. Nevertheless, I wish to show my gratitude, said the serpent king. I beg of you to help yourself to my treasures. Gold or jewels, I care not how much you take. Again the prince refused. Indeed, I am in need of nothing. Then for the third time the serpent king urged him to accept some reward. Very well, said the prince at last. I see you will not be content unless I take something from you. So give me that little old ring you wear as a token of friendship between us. When the serpent king heard this, he was furious and hissed so loudly that the prince trembled with fear. Who has told you to ask for the ring of fortune? he cried. All the rest of my treasures are as nothing beside this, and if I had not promised you whatever you might ask for, you should never have it. However, the serpent had given his word, and he was obliged to let the prince have the ring. The prince slipped it on his finger, and then he hastened away from the ruins, for he was afraid of what the serpent king might do to him. No sooner was he safely out of the jungle than he said to the snake, This is a very foolish thing you have made me do. I might have had enough treasure to make me rich for life, and now I have nothing but this little old ring that appears to be made of very common metal and quite worthless. Do not judge so quickly, replied the snake, for that ring has very wonderful powers. It is able to give you whatever you may ask for. Now do as I tell you, and you will see the wisdom of your choice. Make a clean square place on the ground, and plaster it over, as one does in making a holy place. Lay the ring in the center of it and sprinkle it with sour milk. Then ask for anything you may wish, and it will be yours. This is a very strange story, said the prince, and I can hardly believe it. Still, he made a holy place as the snake directed him, and laid the ring in the center of it and sprinkled it with sour milk. Then, as he was hungry, he said, I wish for all sorts of good things to eat and drink. At once a feast appeared before him. The food was of the most delicious kind, the dishes were of gold and richly carved, and there were napkins of the finest linen fringed and embroidered with silver. The prince could hardly express his wonder and admiration. "'You were indeed right,' said he to the snake. "'Not the greatest king in all the world possesses a treasure as great as this ring.' He then ate and drank to his heart's content, sharing everything with his three companions. After they had made an end of eating, the dishes disappeared and the prince put the ring upon his finger, and he and his companions journeyed on again. He had no wish to return to the city where his brother lived, so they traveled in an opposite direction, and after a while they came to a strange country bordering on the seashore, and ruled over by a very great and powerful king. This king had one beautiful daughter, and she was so lovely that there was not her like in all the world. Many princes and great rulers had sought her in marriage. But the king had declared that no one should have her but he who was able to build a golden palace in the sea in one night. Whoever could do this should not only receive the princess in marriage, but one half of the kingdom as well. But whoever failed in the task should have his head cut off. Many had tried, but none had succeeded, and the king had made a necklace of the heads of those who failed, and had hung it beside the castle gate as a warning to all rash adventurers. But the young prince was not at all frightened by the sight of these heads. He knocked boldly at the palace gates and asked to speak with the king. At once the guards brought him before their master, and the prince said he had come to build the golden palace for the king, and that he wished to set about the matter that very night. 
Rash youth, said the king, have you not seen the necklace of heads that hangs beside the gateway? Do you value your life so little that you are willing to lose it for nothing? I do not think I will lose it, answered the prince. I make no doubt but that I will be able to build the palace, and to build it in one single night as you require. Very well, said the king. If you are determined to make the attempt, I will not forbid you. But you will certainly lose your head, even as others have done before you. The king then commanded that the prince should be taken to the seashore, and that a guard should be set around him, so that if he failed in the attempt, he should not be allowed to escape without paying the penalty. The prince, however, had no thought of escaping. He trusted in the power of the ring, and had no doubt but that as soon as he wished it, the palace would appear. He bade his faithful animals keep watch and rouse him just before dawning, and then he spread his cloak on the ground and lay down and went quietly to sleep. The guards who were set to watch him were amazed. This man must wish to die, they said. He has not even made the first attempt to build the castle, and takes no thought of how the hours of the night are slipping away. Just before dawning, the animals awakened the prince. The dog barked in his ear, the cat scratched him gently, the parrot pulled him by the sleeve, and the snake twisted about his arm and pinched him. The prince yawned and rose up, stretching his arms. He then set about making a square, clean place as before. He plastered it over and laid the ring in the center of it. He then sprinkled it with some sour milk with which he had provided himself and said, I wish a golden palace to be built in the sea immediately. I wish it to have golden turrets and domes and a golden stairway leading up from the water. I also wish it to be furnished throughout with golden furniture and hangings, and I wish it to be in every respect the most magnificent palace in all the world. Immediately, as the prince wished, the golden palace appeared in the sea, and it was in every way exactly as he had asked. The guards who had been set to watch him could hardly believe their eyes when they saw a golden palace arise out of the sea. Look, look, they cried, most wonderful, it must be a magic palace. Almost at the same time, the king in his royal palace awakened, and at once he went to the window to look out across the sea. What was his amazement to see, instead of the stretch of water, a most magnificent palace with golden domes and turrets that glittered in the sun? It was so very beautiful that he could not refrain from crying out with wonder and admiration. He at once made haste to dress and hurried out to find the prince. As soon as he came near where the prince was, he began to call to him. You have done what seemed impossible. Never before have I seen such a beautiful palace. The princess and half of my kingdom are yours, and gladly will I give them to you in exchange for this palace. No, answered the prince, I have no wish for either the princess or the kingdom. The golden castle is mine, and I intend to live in it myself. He then beckoned to a golden boat that lay beside the steps of the palace. At once, and with no one to row it, the boat shot across the water to where the prince stood. The prince stepped into it, followed by his three companions, and it returned to the golden steps with him, and then he landed. The king was greatly disappointed. He now wished very much to have the prince for a son-in-law. He bade his daughter to dress herself in her finest robes and her richest jewels, and come with him to visit the prince. The princess was not loath to do this, for she wished very much to see inside the palace. She dressed herself finely, as her father commanded, and then went with him to the palace. No sooner did they come to the room where the young prince was, and no sooner did he look upon the princess, than he fell violently in love with her, for he had never before seen such a beauty, and he wished to marry her at once. This pleased the king greatly. The princess was quite willing, for she had fallen in love with the prince, even as he had with her. So a feast was made ready as soon as possible, and the prince and princess were married with the greatest pomp and magnificence. For some time afterward, the young people lived together in happiness, but after a while the princess lost all her cheerfulness and became very sad and mournful. The prince could not tell what ailed her. One day he found her weeping. My dear princess, he said to her, why are you so sad and mournful? Do you no longer love me? Or is there something you wish for that is lacking in our palace? There is nothing lacking, answered the princess, and indeed I love you better every day we live together. Then what ails you, my dear one? The princess again began weeping. I am weeping, said she, because everything you have here in the palace is golden, and 
I wish to be golden, too, for that would be so beautiful. Oh, my dear husband, is there not some way by which I also may be turned to gold? Yes, answered the prince, that can easily be done, and since you are no longer happy as you are, I am willing to oblige you. He then cleared a square place and prepared it as before, and laid the ring in the center of it, and sprinkled it with sour milk. I wish, said he, that the princess may become golden. At once the princess was turned into gold, every bit of her, her head and body and hands and feet, even her nails and hair and eyelashes became gold. Now are you content? asked the prince. Oh, I am so happy I can hardly contain myself. But that is a very wonderful ring that you have, and I am well pleased to know of its power. So saying, the princess went away to look at herself in a mirror and to admire her golden beauty. Not long after this, the princess was combing her hair, and three hairs caught around the comb and were pulled out. It is a pity there's no poor person here in the castle to whom I can give these hairs, said the princess, for they are very valuable. She did not wish to throw away that much gold, so she took a piece of paper and made a box of it. In this she coiled the three hairs and set it afloat on the sea. It may be they will fall into the hands of someone who needs them, thought the princess to herself. Now a light wind was blowing, and it carried the paper box on and on over the waves, until it came to the borders of another country ruled over by another king. There the box drifted ashore, and there it was picked up by a servant from the palace close by. The servant examined the box and wondered over the golden hairs it contained. They seemed to him so very beautiful that he carried them back to the palace and showed them to the king, and the king in turn showed them to the prince, his son. No sooner did the prince see the hares than he fell desperately in love with the golden princess to whom they belonged, even though he had never seen her. I feel sure that only a princess could have such hair, said he, and that she must be the most beautiful creature in all the world, and unless I can see her and win her for a bride, I feel sure I shall die of longing. Indeed, this desire to see the princess was so great that he became very ill and not all the physicians in the kingdom were able to cure him. The king was greatly troubled. He feared the prince would indeed die with longing, as he said. He therefore sent out a proclamation that anyone who would find the princess and bring her to his palace should name his own reward. Whatever it was, it would be given him, even to half the kingdom. Now, there lived not far from there an old wise woman who was very crafty. She came to the palace and asked to see the king, and when she was brought before him, she said, O oh, king, I am willing to undertake this matter, and I feel sure I can find the princess with the golden hair and bring her to the prince. But first, I wish to make sure that in such a case I shall receive a reward as you have promised. What I have promised, I have promised, replied the king, and if you succeed in this matter, you will have whatever you ask for. Very well said the wise woman, then I will undertake it. She told the king that she would need for the adventure a golden boat with four strong rowers trained to obey every motion she made without her having to speak to them. She would also need in the boat a large cradle made of all sorts of different colored silks and silken ropes to swing it by. All these things the king gave her, and then the old woman set out in search of the princess. The rowers rowed on and on, and after a long, long time they came within sight of the golden castle, and as soon as the wise woman saw it she knew that it must be there that the princess of the golden hair lived. She made the rowers draw up the boat beside the steps, and then she hastened up the steps and went into room after room of the castle until she came to the place where the princess was sitting. As soon as she saw the princess she gave a cry of joy and ran to her and put her hands on her head as is the custom with relatives and then she took the princess in her arms and kissed her. The princess was very much surprised at having a strange old woman come into the palace and treat her in this way, and she tried to push her away. But the more the princess tried to push the old woman away, the closer the old woman held her. Oh, my dear niece, cried she, do you not know me? I am your old aunt. No, answered the princess, I do not know you, and I did not know I had an aunt. What? cried the wise woman, pretending to be very much surprised. Has your father never spoken of me? No, he has not. Ah, oh, well, it is a long time since he and I parted. 
The old woman then told the princess a long story of how she and the princess's father were brother and sister, and of how they had played together as children, and of how she had journeyed away to live in a far-off kingdom when the princess was still a very little girl. She told it so cleverly that the beauty could not but believe it, and in the end she made her pretended aunt welcome, and they sat down and talked together pleasantly. The pretended aunt asked the princess a great many questions about the palace and how she lived, and why there were no servants to be seen anywhere. We have no need of servants, answered the princess, because my husband has a ring that has very wonderful powers, and it supplies us with everything we want. He has only to ask for anything, and it appears. That is a very wonderful story, said the wise woman. And where does your husband keep his ring? Oh, he wears it always on his hand. The wise woman then asked where the young prince was, and whether he were at home. No, he has gone hunting with my father, dear aunt. They often go hunting together. And does he take the ring with him when he goes hunting? Yes, it never leaves his finger, except when he is working magic with it. The pretended aunt shook her head. That is very dangerous, she said. Suppose something should happen to him while he is hunting, and the ring should be lost. That would be a great misfortune to both of you. He should leave the ring at home with you and then it would be safe, and you would have it here at need. That is very true, answered the princess. I had not thought of that. I will ask him to leave it with me the next time he goes hunting. The wise woman was well satisfied with this and rejoiced in her heart, for she believed the prince would do as the princess wished in the matter, and after the princess had the ring in her possession, she felt sure she could lure her away with her. She and the princess sat together talking for a long time, and before the prince came home, the wise woman begged the princess not to tell him she was there. I have many fine robes, said she, but they are in another boat that is following not far behind. When it arrives, I will dress myself in a way that is suitable, and then you shall present me to the prince. To this the beauty agreed, and so when her husband came home, she told him nothing about the visit from her pretended aunt. The next day the prince was going hunting again, and before he set out, the princess begged him to take off the magic ring and leave it with her. This he was loath to do, but she entreated him so anxiously to let her keep it, that at last the prince could refuse her no longer. He took off the ring and placed it in her hand. No sooner had the prince left the palace than the old wise woman hastened to the princess and asked her whether her husband had left the ring with her. Yes, answered the princess. Here it is, and I intend to put it on a ribbon and hang it about my neck so that I may not lose it. That is a wise plan, said the pretended aunt. She then began to talk to the princess of the beautiful boat in which she had come thither, and of the strong rowers, and of the many-colored cradle that hung from silken ropes and swung with every breath of wind. The princess became very curious to see these fine things and the pretended aunt easily persuaded her to come down with her to the boat and to enter into it. She showed the princess where the cradle was hung, and while the princess was admiring it, the wise woman motioned the rowers to row away from the palace steps and away across the sea, and this they did. The princess was so busy examining the cradle that it was some time before she noticed that they were moving onward, and that the palace was far behind. Then she was very much surprised and troubled. Where are we going? she asked of the wise woman. I do not think my husband would like me to leave the palace. I must return at once. Presently, presently, answered the pretended aunt. But first lie down in the cradle and see how pleasantly it rocks with the motion of the boat. Mm, only for a moment then, said the princess, and she lay down in the cradle. At once, by her magic arts, the wise woman threw her into a deep sleep, and then she took the ring from the ribbon around the princess's neck and put it upon her own finger. The princess slept until they arrived at the kingdom whence the wise woman had come. She then aroused the princess and bade her leave the boat and follow her. "'Where are we, and why have you brought me hither?' asked the princess. "'I have brought you hither to marry you to one of the finest young princes in the world.' and one who is dying for love of you. The princess was horrified. I can never love anyone but my own dear husband, and I will always be true to him and never marry anyone else. The old woman obliged the princess to come with her before the king, however, 
and when he saw how very beautiful she was, he was amazed. He sent for his son, and the young prince came in haste. As soon as he saw the golden princess, he wished to take her hand and tell her how he loved her. But she would not allow him to touch her, nor would she listen to him. Very well, said the king. I see you do not love the prince as yet, but you soon will. We will wait for a month, and then you shall marry him, whether you wish it or not. It was in vain that the princess wept and entreated and implored. What I have said, I have said, declared the king, and nothing can change me. The princess was then led away to the apartments prepared for her, but the old wise woman kept the ring, for that was the reward she demanded of the king, and she would not accept anything else. Now, while all this was happening, the prince of the Golden Palace returned from hunting and was very much surprised not to see his princess waiting on the golden steps to greet him, for this had always been her custom. He called her, but there was no answer. He hastened from room to room of the palace, searching everywhere. When he could not find her, he was in despair. "'Someone has stolen her,' he cried, "'and surely she is lost to me forever.' "'Master, do not be so desperate,' said the parrot. What are my wings for except to serve you? There was an old woman who came here while you were away, though you did not know it. I make no doubt but that she has stolen the princess. Now I will fly abroad far and near, and never will I return until I find her. And I, said Puss, will go with you, for after you have found the princess, my wit and claws may be of use to her. But how will you cross the sea, and how will you cross the rivers that divide the kingdoms? I will also go with you, said the dog, and I will swim the sea and rivers, for that I can do, and Puss shall ride on my back dry-footed. To this the parrot agreed, and the three set off together. They journeyed on and on for a long time, hither and yon, until at last they came to the very kingdom to which the old woman had carried the princess, and there, through an upper window of the palace, the parrot saw the gleam of golden hair. At once he called to the dog and cat. Surely that is the princess, sitting there at an open window. Do you wait, and I will go and see whether it is certainly she, and then I will return and tell you. The parrot flew up to the palace window and lighted on the sill. The princess had been weeping, but when she saw him, she gave a cry of joy. Oh, my dear parrot, is the prince here? she cried. Has he come to save me? No, princess, answered the bird. He could not travel so fast and far as we, so he is waiting mournfully at the Golden Palace for us to return. Give me the Ring of Fortune, that I may carry it back to him, and then he can wish you back with him again. At these words, the princess began to weep more bitterly than ever. She told the parrot how she had been lured away, and how the wise woman had stolen her ring from her while she was asleep. You must manage to get the ring back into your possession, said the parrot, for until you have it, we can do nothing. That is impossible, wept the princess. The old woman keeps the ring in her mouth both night and day. No one is allowed even so much as to see it. This makes the matter more difficult, said the parrot. I will have to consult the others about it. He then flew back to where the dog and cat were waiting and told them all the princess had said. Did I not say that you would need me, said Puss? I will manage to steal into the palace and to the chamber of the princess and then I can arrange some way to make the old woman give up the ring. Meanwhile, do you return to the princess and hide yourself behind the curtains in her room, for I may need your help. It did not take the cat long to find a way to enter the palace, and she then slipped along the passages and up the stairways to the chamber where the princess was. The princess was no less glad to see Puss than she had been to see the parrot. The cat prowled about the room and soon found several rat holes back of the hangings. Now, listen, mistress, said the cat. Today you must ask them to prepare you some boiled rice for your supper. When it is brought to you, do not eat it all. Save a portion of it and scatter it on the floor near the rat holes. Be sure to do this, for I have a plan in my head by which I hope to save you. The princess promised to do as the cat said. And when, a little later, the wise woman came to visit her, the princess asked to have rice for her supper. When the rice was brought, she ate only a little of it, and then when no one was looking, she scattered the rest of it on the floor near the rat holes. All this while the cat and the parrot remained hidden behind the curtains. That night, according to her custom, the wise woman slept in the princess's chamber. 
When all was still and no one waking but the guard outside the door, the rats came out from their holes and began to eat the rice the princess has scattered about. This was what Puss was waiting for. At once she pounced from behind the curtains and caught the largest and fattest of the rats. Holding it in her teeth, she climbed upon the old woman's bed and tickled the old woman's nose with the rat's tail. This made the old woman sneeze, and when she sneezed, the ring flew out of her mouth and rolled across the floor. The parrot was on the watch. It caught up the ring in its beak and flew out of the window with it, while the cat made haste to slip out of the palace the way she had come in and rejoin the dog who was waiting below. Meanwhile, the wicked old wise woman was like one distracted. The sneeze had awakened her, and as soon as she awoke, she discovered the ring was gone from her mouth. She did not know what had become of it and hunted everywhere, but she could not find it. She shook and trembled and raged against the princess, but rage as she might, it did not bring back the ring, for it was gone. The parrot flew on and on with the ring till his breath failed and his wings flagged, but by morning he was back at the golden palace. He flew through a window into the room where the prince was and dropped the ring on the table before him. When the prince saw the ring, he could hardly believe his eyes, and it seemed as though his heart would leap out of his bosom with joy. He at once prepared a square place as before and laid the ring in the center of it. He sprinkled it with sour milk and wished that his own dear princess would return to him, and at once in a twinkling there she stood before him in all her golden beauty. She and the prince fell upon each other's necks, weeping with joy, and from that time on they lived together in love and happiness and the prince never again allowed the ring of fortune to go out of his possession. End of The Wonderful Ring by Catherine Pyle Read by Colleen McMahon